Hello, welcome back to the Swiss Alps, where in today's middle distance race, it is all about the World Cup points. There's only, after this, one race left to go of the season, and it's still to be decided who will be the overall World Cup champions. We had two Swiss victories yesterday in the two relay classes. Will the home nation be able to repeat that success today? We will find out in the next few hours or so, but it's gorgeous conditions here by the lake in Davos and the forest, I've got to tell you, is absolutely beautiful. I think there'll be a lot of, I hope there will be a lot of satisfied and happy orienteers by the end of today's races because it is looking very good. We will start with the women's race though and then move on to the men's, although we have had people starting over the last couple of hours in both classes. Uh, so we will focus on the last few runners as is usual. They're setting off in reverse world ranking order so not world cup points order but world ranking order and yeah who who are the ones we're going to watch out for in terms of those world rankings uh, we've got of course in the women's class tova alexanderson leading and this could be quite a decisive day for her yeah i mean she is uh, at the moment in the world cup she is having 307 point uh, points so she's leading by 83 points and uh you get 100 points for a victory and 80 points for a second place. So if she's going to win this race today, she is the overall World Cup winner of this season. So it can be a decisive race today already. Lena Strand sitting there. She didn't uh, run yesterday's relay. Neither did Tova Alexanderson. And if you're looking into the men's class, uh, Martin Regborn, Gustav Berryman, they're also in contention for kind of those top World Cup positions. They didn't run either. Is that going to be an advantage yeah, today? Definitely an advantage. I mean, we have seen the race yesterday. It's, it was a tough race and uh, of, physically. And I mean, that's uh, it's an advantage to not have been running, especially because the terrain yesterday wasn't very relevant or representative uh, compared to today, so you don't even get an advantage due to the terrain knowledge. But, um, well, it's like this, and we had. Uh, it's not often we have to relay first, so it no. was it was kind of due to that, I guess. Yeah, and actually, a lot of a lot of people won't won't run the relays. You know, we've seen the World um, Championships before that that often some of the the really best runners in, in the nations they're going to look at the um, they're going to look at the the individual races but let's talk through this course because yeah, it's mean, one one we're really excited about we can see here on the map already it's totally different compared to yesterday it's a beautiful middle distance terrain and we start in this women's race with a few shorter controls one two three there's a downhill between two and three and then we have the first climbing to control four and five and then from there control five maybe one of the more decisive legs from today. It's uh, the only real long leg, uh, five six. And we co we talked to the course planner. Um, he, Fabian Hartner and Sara Lusche were the course planners. So they thought that yeah maybe they will go around uh, to the left as we can see here on this small track, or then quite straight forward. And we have some pictures here. This is at control six, so this is the first TV control. So right after the long, the long leg. Then we continue with two shorter legs or three shorter legs to control seven and eight. It's green there on the map, but actually you get some quite good um, tracks or passages between this green area. And then nine, ten, another. Yeah, a bit longer leg, and you have to be careful here because it's changing in characteristics. There in between, it's quite stony, it's not as fast as it is and open in the beginning. Then the map flip at control 10, so they have a second loop on a different map, 11, 12, 13, with uh, a few shorter uh, controls. And then the, uh, we have the second TV split at control 14. There, the, control, uh, the terrain is very open and a nice runnability, but you have to be careful. I mean, it's open and the runnability is good, but every everything that's behind the tree is hidden because mm. the trees are so dense. Uh, downhill towards the finish. We're close to the end of the course now. Control 15 and then, yeah, a really steep, steep downhill job. to control 16. And then slightly, yeah, we get back into the arena. There's no arena passage today. Um, 
but we will get, of course, we will see the runners at, out in the forest, which is almost nicer for us <laughs> to follow. Yeah, and there's some crowd gathering here. There's a national uh, competition on um, uh, today, so they're going to be watching and looking at these big screens. So let's have a look at some analysis then of this leg five to six that you picked out. As, is, it's the longest leg. There is some route choice here. There's some options to go on some of the paths. I mean, one of the options is here to go around all the way my guess is that it's a bit too far because the terrain is quite nice to run, but we have to wait. It's always hard to say for the course planners or for us when we're pre-running uh, compared to when you run full speed, we have the world-class orienteers executing the, the legs. It's something different. But yeah, you can see here this uh, purple lane. It's a bit shorter, it's more straight, but of course you have to go through the, those stony areas. And the beginning there on this track, uh, on the track is really fast. And between, uh, if you take the blue line, you have, when you leave the red option, you have a small track, with, which helps you a lot with the runnability, of course, and also with direction. And then you had, quite toward the end, you have this fence that helps you really much in uh, the control, taking the last meters towards the control. Yep, so we can look towards the end of the start list now and, and have a focus on here. We've got a couple of they're starting two minute intervals. These are the last 30, so a lot of those we're going to focus on. Uh, and, and, and who do you think could do too well in this type of terrain? It's maybe more Scandinavian than people are going to expect for, for this type of yeah, for, I mean, for Switzerland. Everyone has seen the map before. There was an old map, so I think they know more or less what to expect, but it's very Scandinavian. I think that, the, I, I mean, if you're talking from a Swiss point of view, <laughs> it's, it's more Scandinavian terrain than typical Swiss terrain. So there's no big advantage for the Swiss runner, not as yesterday. Um, I expect the Norwegian runner to do to, to good and the Swedish runners and I mean we have so yeah Team Sweden is so strong so I think everyone there is among the favourites almost yeah, well, we saw uh, Siri Silverloinen sitting there in the leader's chair. She's been sitting there for a good kind of 20 minutes or so, I'd say. Uh, she's our current lead at the time, 38.52. A healthy lead for her over Hannah Muller at this point. And I think they actually came to the finish uh, at the same time. So, she, so yeah, pretty comfortable position. But, of course, we're going to expect to see that time coming down to closer to kind of 33 minutes that we'd usually see for an expected winning time. So, uh, first... First, uh, first athlete we'll focus on at the start, Miri Turner Erdem. She is uh, very excited to be back in the, the forest. She was part of the Danish team who were fifth at the World Championships in that uh, sprint relay. But she, I know, she's actually been in Switzerland for the last month preparing for this. She's very excited. Let's talk about this long leg, though. And we can see a lot of people, yeah, dropping down and using that track. And you can see the different runners uh, taking different lines in that slope. It is very rocky, as, as you can see from the map, as you come up that slope. I mean, but, I mean it's yeah. very different in different parts of the map. In the beginning, it's the runnability is really good until Control 5. And then you between Control 5 and 6, you see it on the map. I mean, it gets very stony and it, it slows you down. It's harder to read the map. So you have to change and adapt your technique. You have to be careful, maybe slow down a little bit in order to be sure uh, where you are. It's the general thing on the map. The, I mean, the, you experience it to be very good visibility when you're running. And I mean, that's true. And as, so, as long as you have the contact with the map, it's totally doable because you have many features to navigate with. Um, so you, don't, you shouldn't get lost. But uh, it's tempting to overpace in some uh, places and as soon as you're not 100% sure where you are, it's so difficult because everything looks the same. And relocating in this kind of terrain is really difficult because you can see it here. The, uh, the visibility looks good, but if you take the right part of the picture here, you don't see, really see what's behind. So the trees are really blocking your view and that makes the relocating really difficult. So Ursula Fesselhofer was Ursula Kadan is now into that third place. So we were comparing against Siri Silverlinen, who's our leader at the finish, but at the leader at this point, this is his TV1, is Marion Aby as well. So uh, yeah, looking pretty good uh, at this point for the Austrian. And because of this uh, kind of deceptive visibility, I think we'll see maybe see some parallel errors going on, I think. It's maybe on some of the shorter Yeah, I mean, it, it's, 
I mean, you don't. It, it's not necessary that you have to do mistakes. As I, sh I said, I mean, it's. Uh, I think there will be runners getting through the course without making mistakes. But once you do a mistake, uh, there is a risk that you do, will do a big mistake. Yeah, th there really is. It's. Let's have the comparison then. This is the uh, just after the map flip. Uh, so it's Silver Noinen and Elin Monson. Looks good. You see that Silver Noinen was a bit off direction there towards, towards Control 13. That's something. I mean, in this, on the shorter legs, you don't get lost very much, but you have to be very careful with, with direction. We can follow Monson though into the second TV split. So that's control number 14 on the women's course. And you can see it here it's again. I mean, the, 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 the forest is open, but now you, I mean, the, the runners are just behind one tree and you, you barely can see them. So it's, that's kind of a, yeah, it's, it, it, it's strange because <laughs> you have the feeling that visibility is very good at all places but you have to be flexible because sometimes you just don't see features. Yeah, you just have to be really <laughs> aware of everything. Runners from the national competition there as well. <laughs> <laughs> to be orienteering and then suddenly you have all these world-class orienteers going past you, it's quite exciting. But second place there for Munson. So um, yeah, maybe dropping a little bit uh, there compared to um, uh, Sirius of Anoinen, who evidently had a really good kind of second part of the course. So, w she's really only got the descent now into the finish before we will see Monson into the finish. This looks like Vendula Hochitkova. It is. It's 25th at the European Champs in Middle Distance. Yeah, and part of the medal winning uh, relay team at those European Champs as well. But back to the GPS we go and we'll look at the Dane. And there you could actually use the track a bit longer because where she headed up, uh, it was very stony. And when it's stony, it's it's not only the runnability, but it's also much harder to read the map at the same time as you run. So it's harder to keep direction and uh, keep map contact, and that's very important today. But she she solved it good. But I think it's it's just to find the tracks that make you a little bit faster. So Agnes Nogod cracked is just, you can see how much she's looking around here and uh, trying to spot all the features. Here she is though. So that was control number 13. Mm -hmm. So she's on the way to the TV control. Here she is, it's a short control. And this is Katrin Müller compared to Silva Neunen. Katrin Müller, she had a great fall season so far. Really one of the shooting stars in the Swiss team. Yeah, she's her form has improved and her results have improved because of that. Just this season, I think, uh, really fantastic uh, races at the, the, the Swiss uh, National Championships and also at the World University Championships, also held in Switzerland. So uh, loads of races on, on home soil. And she's, you know, you can tell her, I'm sure her confidence will be increasing and increasing. But she's the next one we'll see then at these, uh, these controls, 13, 14. Here she is. Mm -hmm. And she was in second position as you mentioned before at the pre-warning to the first TV control uh, behind Marion Abbey. So here she is on the way. This is a tricky little control to 13. They've got to climb. See Up how she pit. handles the situation to have the cameraman behind her. Uh, she doesn't look too sure about and this now she's it's really difficult for her to relocate here if you look around you don't see that far even though uh, and actually the 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 vegetation on the ground does disguise some of the contours a little bit mm -hmm. so it's not as easy to see but you can see she's changed direction quite a lot actually she spotted the control, yes. now you could see it on the speed. Yeah. It's a small mistake here. 
<laughs> and it looks like others coming in the same direction yeah. as she's followed, pulled others uh, around as well. But the time is still good compared to Silvanoinen. So that was control number 13. We'll get the time check at control number 14. Here she is. Alongside Karina Poltzer of Austria. She was but about that is pretty good. Yeah, she, over she a minute about quicker. 30 minute, uh, uh, 15 seconds faster than compared to Silvanoin at the first TV control. Or of the 1K of running. We don't have her time at the first TV control, unfortunately. But now uh, it's increased to 1.13. So even though she did a small mistake there, uh, when we her had her in the picture, she's still in the lead here, one thirteen ahead of Siri Silvanoinen. So Silvanoinen's uh, reign on the leader's chair might soon be at an end because all the captain really has to do is, is the controls on the descent here. But now let's see if we can uh, look for the Dane, though, into the finish very shortly. No, this we will looks look like for Monson, Monson first. Here she is. Uh, I think that's the second last control, right? Yep, yep, it is the second last control in that depression. And then just the descent into this uh, very gorgeous arena. There's a, it's quite a strange last control. A few of the runners have been having some difficulties. I don't know if we're going to be able to bring you that picture. There we are. As she runs down the slope, you just need to follow the, um, the little branded signs along and then up and over this hill. But a lot of the, the early runners have been stopping on the, on the top of this hill. That's kind of where they think the control should be. Often that would make sense to have the control up there. But it's actually just, you see, she's even checking the map here. It's just around the corner. Uh, and on the end, kind of just off the end of the hill, to be honest, and then we'll run into the finish. But it will be third place then for Ellen Monson. So, a new third best time. Now, I think we are waiting for Marion Abbey on the way to the second TV control. She's in the lead at the first TV control after 1.8 kilometers around a minute ahead of Ili Monson. Yeah, let's see if we can spot her. Here she is. That looks like her. Yes, indeed. <laughs> this is a little bit more dense than some other parts of the forest, I think, like and some of those fallen and trees. But it's a good, it's yeah, a good really time. Yeah, really good run. Two minutes and sixteen faster. I mean, uh, that is a, a few, big gap at this point. A few of the seconds are due to the mistake Katrin Müller did. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's not. She didn't do a two minutes mistake there. So very good race so far by Mario Nabi. Yeah, it's a lot of an opportunity as we follow uh, the Dane into the finish. Agnes Nilgaard cracked, uh, who uh, will be in for maybe, oh, I think she might be in for a fourth best time, something like that. Um, again, she just checks where the control is. We've seen this a lot. It's, it, it's almost instinctive, I think, for it to be on the top of the hill. That's where you just feel like the the organizers the course setters would have put it but anyway uh we'll go into uh fourth place there so great result for the dane uh early early on in this uh middle distance though and um you know with with a, with the big teams of the world cup uh, you know, much bigger than a, than a world championships. It gives people like Katrin Müller, Marion Aby the chance to kind of really show what they can do. Yeah, and I mean, uh, especially when you have these big nations, uh, then of course it's important that they get a chance uh, to prove what they're able to do in, in the World Cup in order to maybe qualify to the world championships or the European championships next time. I mean, it's already a step between the World Cup and the European Championships, you have uh, yeah, mo you have more starting positions at the European Champs, but then it's very hard to qualify for the World Championships. So those races for sure are important for the runners, maybe just a little bit behind the top runners in their own country.
Okay, so let's compare uh, Cecile Calandri to Siri. Oh, look, a little mistake uh, there, mistake. I think. Oh, a big mistake. And that's, <laughs> that's something, I mean, uh, at this point She's there, so you can be very close and you can see that those holes or those dis depressions because of all the stones around and because the hole is on top of the hill. So if you come from below, of course, you don't see uh, the hole behind. So you have to be very accurate with direction there and a little bit patient as well because you might still have the feeling from the distance from earlier in the race and then you lose it a bit when you get towards in these stony areas. So this is Katrin Muller. Can she take the new fastest time then at the finish and uh, take that leader's chair? It's looking very, very good for her. She's going to just drop down out of the forest any second soon. Here she is. And... But she lost some time there. Yeah, she's lost a bit of time. She was about a minute ahead, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, minute and, and four seconds. Losing a little bit more time there, maybe just not taking the descent quite as well. But it, I think it still will be a new leading time, though, for the Swiss runner. She will be hopefully pleased with the result, even if a bit annoyed with some mistakes out there in the terrain and cheered on by the home crowd to take a new leading time then. There we go. So it is the new best time at the finish, 38 minutes and 31 seconds still. And I mean, even though she did a mistake maybe in the, in the end or a few mistakes in the end, I mean, she's in the lead when she finishes. Um, and it's definitely one of the better World Cup races she has shown uh, this season and in her career. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good run for her, but there's loads more Swiss athletes to come, not least Marion Abbey. This is really is good. Let's take her to the finish. Marion Abbey, look at the time there, almost four minutes ahead. Wow, she's had a fantastic end. And we know, we guess uh, Muller has made some uh, mistakes, but uh, Abby looks really strong here. And she's working so hard around the corner, looking fantastic. I mean, she has been away from elite orienteering a few years, struggling after her junior years, and then kind of made a great comeback in Idre at the middle distance last season. And now look at this time here. Wow, Almost 35 three and a half minutes five. Plus. Wow, three and a half minutes at this point. That is really huge. Nittinen actually was coming in alongside her, takes a new second best time. But yeah, that's very, very impressive. I mean, she showed earlier this season already that she, in part of the race, she can be very, very quick, but then she never really get it. Uh, at the two at the whole race. There was always one or two mistakes that kind of destroyed her performance. Uh, but today it seems to be a very, very good race. Yeah, you can look here. She kind of takes. I like that. I mean, she was good just route choice around kissing there. the track there mm. a little bit, touching it, and to get in order and to be going sure. Into that re entrant and back out again where it wasn't stony. She really good there. This is Ingrid Lundener, so we saw that comparison between the two of them. So, Marin uh, Abbey's lead is. It's considerable at this point, but let's see what Ingrid Lindenez has been able to do up to this point. You can see her just dropping down and just descending here. So we know Nittenen is now in second place. And ahead of uh, Nittenen at this point was Muller and um, Abby. So now Lindenez into fourth spot there. But we're really going to wait for kind of the last, you know, the last 25 is going to be some of the, uh, where we're really going to see some of the, the, the fastest times, I'm sure. Let's, so we will now see uh, Fesselhofer then, I think, into this second TV split. You know, it didn't seem to be too many mistakes on that GPS tracking that we've seen. Well. I mean, uh, and Fesselhofer, she was about a minute behind at the first TV control. You can see it here. It's clearly more. Uh, it's about two and a half minutes, maybe. Um, and that's, I mean, it's a bit what we talked about before. It's possible to go to get through without mistakes, but you have to be really focused all the way in order to be able to do that. And you have to be really fast. You can't, if you do this too many times, even if you 
don't make a mistake, even if you just have this hesitation on a few controls, then it's going to be tough. Yeah, and the, Here's I mean, the control. You have to be very precise all the way to the mm. control. That's what I, I mean. It's so easy to lose patience and. And now, when you don't really know, I mean, look around, it's hard to get any feature there or the counters. Oh, there we go. And I think she spotted the control yeah. flag now, or the cameraman at least. <laughs> it's hard to spot that. You can see some of the, the, the open areas around. Um, you know, you can see that in the picture, but there's lots of mixed open and forested areas and... Things do kind of look the same around there. But yeah, a few people having some problems with number 13. And now we can see Fesselhofer drop down into 14 when we get the TV split. We reckon from the GPS about two and a half minutes behind, maybe it's going to be more like three by the time I mean, we get this I mean, she did a split. small mistake after that yep. as well. So it's 319 now into fifth position. can see here control five to six can see that she used that track there uh, but a quite a good start here yeah for Tunelia. had a good uh, relay yesterday it's, uh, it's she's 40 years old but uh, she had kind of the her breakthrough now mm. uh, the last yeah maybe this season even Good performance at the European Championships relay. Good performance yesterday in the relay. Yeah, part of that uh, medal winning team, of course. And this, you know, you're contouring around at this point to try and find a re entrant that's only, that's only one contour deep. You've really got to have, if, especially if you're going to take the route choice that you've got to have, you've got to be really confident that you're on the right height in the slope. Which is if, if you're used to slope orienteering, things like that is, you know, you get better at doing those kind of things. It can be really tricky skill, but third place there. Miss uh, Santa Fast, 42 seconds down. Here's Ingrid Lindenez into the finish, I believe. Absolutely. And... Is she going to be on for a new, maybe, second fastest time here? Has evidently had a good descent down the hill, pulled up a couple of places. Of course, we know um, uh, Catherine Miller had some mistakes towards the end, but looking really good for Ingrid Lindenez. Again, she, I think, was one of the first leg runners in the Norwegian team yesterday. Working really hard to go over the brow of this hill and punch the last control. Tries to spot it over to her left. And it looks like it will be a new second fastest time then here for the Norwegian. So some strong running in the last part of the course can really make a difference, I think, here in the standings. And great position for her at the moment. Of course, it's still a big gap behind the, the leader as far as the middle distance is concerned. But looking pretty good. <laughs> she found it really, really nice to, to say it. Well, the, the word she, she used wasn't really nice, but she, <laughs> the, what she wanted to say was that it was nice. <laughs> she said sometimes she hesitates a little bit, but that might be better than to go full speed and then just, just fuck it up. <laughs> ah, and even the weather is good, she says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be the... I think we'll see that the... For better and better orienteers towards the end, making a lot fewer hesitations. We'll see them being a lot smoother uh, through the terrain. But yeah, you've got to, as always, it, it's trying to get the balance of speed right, that you can make sure you're still able to orienteer uh, properly and do some good things. Here's Cecile Calandri, who we saw make a mistake to that 12th control. It's really pushed her right down the rankings. Such a shame for the, for the young French talent. Um, but she will be into 15th place at the moment. Mm. 
And here we have the medalists from the European Championships compared to Mario Nabi, Evely Kasiku. One of the big surprises from the European Championships. You can see it, it's, it's, it's details here, but she's entering the stony area just a little bit higher and has to spend a few more meters in this very stony area there. Yeah, there's so many little kind of micro route choices and, and just knowing this terrain, where is quick to run, where is less quick to run, if you get lucky. And there's quite a few kind of animal tracks out there. I also got the feeling when pre-running that it's been tested quite well. Um, you could kind of see some tracks in the forest, like I mean, into not, and out of controls. Not, not, not in loads, parts but like here, when no, you see it no, here. But in, in a few parts, you have grassy underground, and there, of course, it will track up. But they also have this, I mean, we have seen a few runners here from the national competition. They also have other runners in the competition area. And that might be a good thing today, because then we will get tracks from there as well. Maybe it will confuse them a little bit. So, Emily Kazaku, the silver medalist, silver of the European champs, that middle distance on home soil, of course. Uh, making good progress through here, but of course, significantly less familiar terrain, although I know she will, you know, her form should be pretty good, and, and she, I'm sure, will have taken a lot of confidence from, from that home win. You can see her just looking around, looking behind her. It's so unnerving when you have a, uh, a running camera behind you. Um, I mean, how anyone must keep their concentration is impressive. And they, you know, they do they do train for being able to deal with distractions, things like this. And, and once you're someone like Everly, who has a lot more experience on the World Cup circuit, then you kind of get used to this situation. All right, let's go back to the start then. Eleanor Ross is uh, on her way very, very shortly part of the gold medal winning relay team from yesterday and yeah that the whole team were pretty strong there so Eleanor Ross will want to perform very well on this home terrain she's probably a slightly stronger she's she's a better sprinter than than in the forest but I mean really she's 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 a, she's an all-rounder um, and she's really good at when she manages to get it all right so you can see already kind of looking up into the terrain. This is one of the, there is a little bit of undergrowth here, but it's really not too bad. It's it's very runnable, very uh, visible. Especially it's not stony in this part. And then, uh, it, I mean, it makes the runnability much better, even if it's a little bit bushy on the, on the gr ground. As you see Megan Carter Davis in the picture here. Might not be a good sign for her. Oh, no. Looking for the control too early. Ah, just missing out directly. And I mean, that's, uh, it's a stupid mistake because you have this track in between and if you check the compass you see that the hill there, the contours, they have to be kind of taking a turn and you have to be behind this hill. So it's really, you, you go up the slope and you can kind of fall off into this re-entrant. Mm. It's not it a difficult control. It kind of directs control. you. Yeah. It, it's quite a big re-entrant and it kind of directs you if, you if you're at the right level, I think. Um, so any Eleva here into TV number two. That'll be the next control she punches, looking quite strong through and, and fast through that control. But she, you've got to get the right direction. You've got to exit the control in the right direction. Uh, those first few steps out of the control uh, can be really crucial, but she kind of corrects that and is going to head down the hill into this 14th control. Here she is, slightly offline. Mm, but we'll go back to the start then. <laughs> Hannah Lundberry, and she um, was kind of in, in those kind of top eight group of runners after the first leg on the in the relay yesterday. She looked like she maybe you know she, she she's not had a good season. She's she's had a big injury for most of the season, and maybe you could kind of tell that by the end of the race she was kind of dropping back from some of the leaders. But maybe in this individual scenario, she's gonna she could perform very well. I mean, in a race like yesterday, when you have such a physical, demanding race and you come out from a long injury, I mean, it's just brutal. I think this one today suits her better. It's more technical. It's of course, it's I mean, it's tech, it's physical demanding as well in some parts but you get other parts where you kind of have to adapt 
the speed and it's more the technical skills that take over. So it's not only pushing very hard all the way to the finish. So I think this yeah, no, this suits her a little bit better. Yeah, I think there's nearly as much climb as yesterday, but you don't quite... It's, it's a bit more spread throughout the course, so it doesn't kind of take it out of you, like, all in one go, to be honest. So I think that's... Um, I think the climb will feel less mm. bad. Here we have Sanna Fast compared to Marion Abbey, and you can see here also Sanna is more than a minute behind, almost two minutes. Yeah, here she is. You that's, can that's, see. You can see here, really. We have almost never seen a, a runner here not hesitating mm. into this control. No, I think this is... I think by the time we get to the last kind of five, ten starters, we will, we will see a lot more confidence into this control. Yeah, but I mean, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. So she drops down there. Has she got it right? Here's the control. There's someone There's coming someone into the picture. There's someone in the corner. I'm sure it looks like a Swedish kit, though. It looks too bright for yeah. a Swedish kit. Oh, this feels like the mistake's getting bigger. I don't know where we can see her. Here's Anna Dukorn into the finish, though. I'm sure we'll catch up with what's happened to Sanna Fast. We have her punch at the, at the TV2 here in the system. So, so I think she was there, 135 behind Mario Nappi. And the Dukorn then in towards the finish. And she will be just outside the top five, I think. This... Norwegian runner who uh, we've seen a lot in the sprint relay teams, but good to see what she can do uh, in the forest. Again, probably one of those runners who who wouldn't make a world champs team in the forest, but really wants to prove what she can do. Here's Paolo Gross, though, no, on I, the I, slope. Sanna Fast must have been first at TV2, then go back to the pre-warning because her time at TV2 is faster than the one at the pre-warning for TV2. So then she must have done a mistake there. I think you're right, and this looks like a mistake for Paula, Paula Gross, who's just in this slope. So this is TV1. We're back to control number six, and it's it's. You can see maybe this is some open area that she's crossing here, and semi-open areas. None of them are. I mean, the, there's some lines through the terrain, so straight lines. I think we're maybe some extraction lanes. You can maybe see some evidence of them here, but it's kind of hard to tell. You know, n none of them are distinct vegetation boundaries, basically, shall we say. Uh, so you kind of have to use them with some care if you're going to use them to navigate. Any Yalava into the finish as well. Uh, and lots of runners around this kind of three, four minute mark, but working hard on this last section of the race. It just kind of shows you Marion uh, Abbey's time, how good it was, how much it's stacking up against these kind of runners of a similar world ranking or a higher world ranking than her, of course. But Any Yalava we trying to make it top five at the moment. She does that. And tries to get the download straight away. So Marion Abbey still our current leader can sit in that uh, leader's chair and it's it's a big gap at the moment and still even if we look at the earlier split controls nobody has gone faster than her she leads the whole way round the course so at this point you're going oh well I wonder how long this, it's going to stack up. This is the mistake up. as I said she first came to control 14 then had to go back to 13 and get this control 14 again. So it's quite a big time loss here for Sanna Fast. Yeah, you can see she just kind of stayed on that same level with the, in with the mm. index contour. You actually have to climb a couple of contours to get up to the control, and she just kind of stayed on that same level, maybe slightly off in the compass or something. Uh, so uh, yeah, a, a shame for her. 
Maria Lawson, Ben, and we're into the last 10 runners now. Of course, we saw her on the middle leg, it was, on the Norwegian relay team. And a very quick start for her. They have a short run out to the first control. Is this Serena Jensen? Uh, Serena, Serena Kiewicz, Kiewicz. yeah. <laughs> It's not Serena, Serena Jensen. That's, that's too many years ago that she became Kibbutz. I need to get it right. Come on. Uh, looks like she's on her way to the sixth control, though. See that you're approaching the control now. It's this open area just before the control. She has to go over the hill there and then she will get to the control. There she is in the picture. So I think yeah, it might be a new third best time here. For yeah, this is Serena. looking really good for Kibbutz. And that was actually Isia Basse who has caught up, who she's nearly caught up, who must have had a, a pretty nightmarish run because she's caught up a long way. Sana Fast then into the finish. That was the second to last control she was running out of and she'll drop down from the track down here. Here she comes. So Sana Fast is going to be maybe outside the top two, maybe outside the top two, three. But I mean, I if think, you look at the time there, she lost, uh, I would say, at least one and a half, two minutes yeah. at this control. So it would have been quite a good race otherwise. But of course, as I said before, you have to be focused all the way. It happens really quickly that you do a mistake uh, when you don't keep a track on your direction. Yeah, it's a really punishing uh, course. So we'll see her through to the finish line. It's going to be fourth place. And yeah, she's not happy with that. She knows that could have been much better, I think. And she, it will not be for her. This is, I guess, Victoria. Or Has that Bjorn start? Maybe. Looks like that from behind. Or Tune Bergen and Leah, I'm not yeah, sure. This, yeah, yeah, this, is, this yeah. is Leah, yeah, into the second TV split. Together with a shadow from her team yeah. in the men's <laughs> race. There's not that many common controls though for the for the men's and the women's races. We can say this already. Only the kind of the TV splits. So um it won't be very useful. She drops down. Into the control. Into the hole there. But third place currently. And we know. And here we have a comparison, the route choice comparison. Mm. You see that Yanisika, she took that middle, the blue option there. And you can see that I guess that's, I mean, yeah, they are synced. She's going a little bit quicker. You can see by the tail, it's but a little bit faster. Now where she is now, Yanisika, she gets the track and then she gets a very nice attack point in this small fence, just about the M of, Mar uh, of Marion's name. But it looks as if this option a little bit around Seem it seems to be a bit quicker yeah it seems to be a little bit quicker i'm yeah i wonder what we'll see kind of with the later runners whether they will again pick up that track it's nice runnability along there contouring around the slope or whether you know there's still some of the, the straight is great mentality that'll that'll make them go kind of similar route to uh, yanashikova you know it's easy to kind of just the running there is pretty good, and you can hit that the line and hit the fence that she's about to see now. I mean, I'm not sure if they synced at control five, or if they're just synced uh, for the whole course. I think it's the whole course. I think and it's the, the whole course. Uh, yeah. If you look at control five, um, there, Marion Abbey was about 25 seconds ahead of Yanisikova, so it's it it seems to be quite equal actually. Okay, so Yanisikova then going to go into this sixth control. We can see what the gap is. So she will now be slower than Abby. Mm -hmm. See if it's within this those 25 seconds. Yeah, you can see how, just how much she's looking around. 
She had a pretty good European Championships as well, though, did Jana Shikova? She knows that she's pretty close. Yes, Here she is. It seems to be very equal. Yeah. It's exactly the same time for those two. Uh, she was one second faster, actually. Yeah, so, so those two It doesn't choices, really matter no. if you go, but maybe it's a bit easier to execute the one that Abby had because you could follow the track a bit longer and then you ch could ch keep the height. You got this open area just before the control, which we saw in, uh, when we followed Sarina keyboards, that it's very good visible when you approach the control. Yeah, and I think if you're very confident in, in your ability to kind of contour around a hill, then that's something that you're going to want to do. Uh, I think it is go around, around that less direct route. Okay, so Hagstrom here, uh, and we're into the last six runners now, as she is about to get underway. Mm, a runner who can do really good at middle distances. She has struggled many times during her career with injuries, uh, but all, often you had the feeling that, yeah, it, it, soon it's her time in the middle distance. That's at least the feeling I had. That's and she was matching the speed of uh, Tove Alexanderson, I think, in some of the, the Swedish championships, just making mistakes towards the latter parts of the course. So, uh, you know, her, her form seems to be very, very good at the end of what has been a very long season, I think, for, for a lot of the runners, especially if they've been kind of aiming to peak at the World Championships and then wanting to kind of convert their training to the forest as well. But let's take uh, Dona Bergudlia into the finish then. And... Uh, We'll see whether she's going to be able to match up to her teammate Lindenez, Ingrid Lindenez, that is, who is in that current second place. We've already talked about how she had such a good uh, first leg on the relays this season, and now an opportunity to show what she can do individually. I mean, as you said earlier, she's uh, she is now compared to the the runners. I mean, it's the world ranking. So, if she comes to the finish in first or second place, that's it's a good race for the runners. It's approximately she she beats almost all the runners she should beat according yeah. to the according world to ranking. World rankings. Um, so definitely a quite okay race here. Yeah. So second place then. Two and a half minutes behind Abby, and uh, now let's have a look at this. Uh, Elena Rose now is going all, almost all the way up. Uh, she's taking some kind of mix between the blue option and this uh, all the way around option we have seen. But she looks fast through the uh, terrain. You can see on that descent. No, she doesn't look fast anymore. I think she's just before the control. She's dropping quite a lot That's, in height, though. Yeah. Wonder, it's hard to see. It would be interesting to get the GPS. Mm. But that's a bit, that's what I meant. I mean, when you have, when you come from the other direction, you have the height. You can just run on the on the same height level and enter the control. And then it's, it's easier to check off the objects before you get this open area and you just don't drop, don't climb, and you will get this open area. I don't know, but then if you're approaching from, from yeah, the north, there's more contours to check off, there's more yeah, but you have to, to check once off. Once you lose them, it's hard to find them again. And the other way, there's no risk that you lose. I mean, you have to hide, so you know more or less where you are. Uh, and she, she, she lost time. I mean, uh, she was in the lead by 37 seconds at control five. Now she is two seconds behind, so she lost about 40 seconds here. Of course, uh, a few of the seconds are due to this mix in the route choice, maybe a uh, few of them are approaching control, but I think it's a good option to go down here. Because from here, I mean, if you don't drop, you will get this kind of lane there, the, the yellow one, and then and then behind, just, just before the control, you have this semi-open area, and you see that very well, as we saw in uh, Kibbert's picture when, she, when we followed her. So the next runner we'll see at control number six will be Hannah Lundberry there. And you can see they've just crossed that at different, different heights. I think where Abby crossed must have been really good. She's, yeah, she's I mean, got some good speed You can see there. again, Hannah Lundberg is a bit more up the hill and she has to cross this stony area for a longer time. Uh, 
she spends a bit a few more seconds in there and that slows her down a bit if we take the time at the first at control five just where they start this route choice we have actually an advantage for Mario Nabi by five seconds so let's see what how this ends up there when they approach this first TV control okay Lisa Risby now on her way on her way around the course first leg runner on the the Swedish team yesterday in the relay mistakes early on but kind of managed to catch up with a good route up the hill so feeling strong I'm sure for her and uh, she had a really great world championships so she was sixth in the middle in in the world championships the last forest one in the Czech Republic she was sixth in the middle and then fourth in the long distance so yep. a real forest specialist and we're back with Hannah Lundberg now approaching the control we know that the advantage for Abby was five seconds at control five so she lost a few seconds here I think she's soon at the control yeah here she comes. she's seen it now so maybe it's that she was a little higher up and had to cross the Estonia section for, yeah, she had to she spent more time in there, so maybe a bit slower just at that point. But otherwise, I mean, the execution was quite similar. Yeah, I mean, it's only a couple of seconds we're talking yeah, here seconds. there, but but I mean, and that, that it's only going to be a few seconds you lose by going through the Estonia area a bit longer, but it can all those add up, you know, all those micro route choices can add up. Paula Gross, though, here, and I think she's going to be on her way to move the 13th control. Let's have a little look compared, compared to our current leader. Yeah, we have the TBS is a little bit off in the, in the slope, though. Mm -hmm. We have seen a, a small mistake before by Paula Gross when she was heading to the first TV control. And, I mean, now you can see it's, it might be more than two minutes that she's behind. Follow her now. Again. Uh, we've seen that so many times yeah. when they approach the second TV control that they start hesitating a bit early. There's like a long and narrow um, spur that you think should be really obvious, and it isn't really that much in the terrain. But let's head back to uh, Benjaminson, ranks currently ranked third in the world rankings. Uh, it's a little bit lower down in the rank in the World Cup standings. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, she's third in the World Cup standings and just some confusion here, I think. No, she's not third in the World Cup standings. Ben Lahari is third and Lina Strand is fourth. I think she's around sixth place, maybe. Here's a control. Mm -hmm. Here she is. This is the thirteenth. And so she's got to drop now down into the 14th. We will actually get that time. Okay, yeah. and then the next runner we'll see is Carolyn Olsen. And she goes this straighter route. So not quite the same as uh, Eleanor Ross, but... Yeah, and the time difference was three seconds there with advantage Olsen at control five. Uh, so it seems to be... Quite similar still, she's approaching the control here. Yeah, you can just see she's crossed one of those uh, cut um, extraction lanes in the terrain, the open lanes. And we'll be able to check her uh, her height and stuff from that. Okay, let's head back to the start though, because Simona Abersold wants to try to take another win on this World Cup circuit. She managed to win the middle distance at the European Championships, and this is home soil for her. She looked really, really good uh, yesterday in the relay, decided it for Switzerland, but we will see what she's able to do. And of course, she does have yesterday's race in her legs. Here's Olsen, she's just dropping into the control. You can see it in the distance there. So we will get yeah. her time. Pa punching there into first position, 14 seconds ahead of Marion Abbey. So good ah, execution so of this leg. Yeah, good execution of that route choice. Here's Serena Kiberts. 
And we're checking her towards control number 13 now, and then number 14. And... So we are synchronized now with uh, uh, Marion Abbey's, Abbey's um, GPS tracker. So Kibbutz looks like she's maybe dropped down a little bit. Ah, but pretty good here, I think, into this control. You can see she just climbed over that spur ahead of it. But here's the last starter, the favourite for today's race. And she did not race yesterday, so she's got fresh legs. She's going to want to attack this. But, you know, she's been out uh, kind of training at altitude as well. But she didn't have a great European chance, though. But she has the chance to win the overall World Cup already today. Um, for me, she's the bigger favourite tomorrow than today. But uh, because we have seen, the thing is when she when she's doing mistakes in the middle distance, she doesn't have the time to Catch get back. Up, yeah. yeah. But in the long distance, she has. So uh, I think if Simon Abrasol wants to get back and maybe win the overall World Cup, uh, she has to hope for mistakes by Tove Alexanderson today. Yeah, Alexanderson. If she wins today, she gets 100 points. Even if Abbasol comes second and only gets 80 points, she's got a 103-point gap. So yeah. there's nothing uh, Abbasol can do in the last race uh, to take that. So if she wins today, if, if Alexanderson wins today, she, that's it. She has won uh, the World Cup for mm -hmm. 2022. Um, can just give you the time for Serena Kibur. She punched into third position, one minute and 36 seconds behind at the second TV control. It's looking better and better for Marion Abbey here. Who spent a long time, a long old time in that leader's chair. Let's compare her route to uh, Joanna Obere, though. Interestingly, I don't think uh, Marion Abbey was on that track to that kind of passed by control number ten. But they're very close, neck and neck here. Mm -hmm. This could be quite interesting. But I mean, this is still quite early into the competition and actually the difficult controls they we haven't seen them yet because the first five controls there they're rather easy to take and then it's this root choice here um yeah i mean you can do mistakes but otherwise we have seen that it doesn't really matter which route you take just you just have to execute it well so it's still quite early into the race here But yeah, it's neck on neck here. <laughs> it's really, really close. Let's see if we can see her through the terrain. Here she is. You can really, again, see she's looking around a lot here. Yeah, and it's all about the, I think, the, the entrance into some of these last controls. Into the last kind of few, last hundred meters or so that you've really got to get right. That's where we've seen people making mistakes. But we didn't see it, but we saw that Olsen went into a new lead there. So hers is the time we compare against. Here we go. Yeah, we can say that she was nine seconds behind Mario Nabi and uh, 12 seconds behind Kathleen Olsen. Just a bit of time here. Here we have the comparison between Abby and Diana Sikova. Usually we, we see mistakes when you get a replay like this, so let's see what happens. Oh, we won't. Maybe we'll see her soon to the yeah. Yeah. To the TV control. Ah, it's quite a good good run on going here for Diana Sikova. She's on the way to the control where we get the split time. Uh, 
Launching there. Into second position. One minute and eight seconds behind Marion Abbey. Not been the best day in the forest, though, for Paula Gross. Shame for her, we've seen a couple few mistakes uh, around the course, but she will finish in uh, 12th position. Yeah, shake the head. We could see a lot of those mistakes there um, in the terrain, so not her day today and Marion Abbey is safe in that leader's chair for the time being. We didn't see Anna Shikova into that TV split, but she did go into second place. Yeah, we saw her going into it, but oh. we didn't get the time. We didn't get the time. How, how close was she? Uh, 108. 108. So not that close. <laughs> when yeah, it but comes. I mean, she's the closest one. She's the closest one so far. But there's only a few controls to go uh, from that point. This is Sarina Kiburts. Yep, she's on her way into the Towards second the to last control. Yep. Here it is in the depression. So let's see here. Maybe good for uh, fourth position. Fourth, fifth, sixth, something there. We have uh, Ingrid Lundenes on third, 2.43 behind. Then we have Mia Nittinen from Finland, 3.01 behind. I think she might be beat Nittinen. It's quite an okay race, what we have seen. No big mistakes by Sarina. No, just dropping time, I think, here and there. And ultimately... Did she, did she punch that control? Maybe she was running just close enough, yeah. passing by, but I'm not sure if she realized that she has to punch a control there. But fourth position currently then. I'm, I'm curious about 51. that. Yeah, she seems to be right there. Okay, let's take the comparison to Lena Strand. Again, the gap, so the tail there is, is one minute, so it's going to be just over the one minute mark as we follow her into the 14th control. Lina Strand is actually one of the runners fighting for a good position, top three position in the overall World Cup. Uh, she's on fourth, fourth position there, uh, only 19 points behind Ven Lahario. Punching there into fifth position, shared fourth. 206 behind. Yeah, and she's going to be looking for some points and, and points compared to those who are around she, her. She lost more than a minute between the first TV control and the second one. So maybe a small mistake at some point. Let's Takes a climb early on that control. Yeah. But I mean, she was. She was only a few, she was only two seconds behind Mario Nabi at the first TV control. She must have lost time here on this second section. I wonder because there's a long control nine to ten that we haven't really been been seeing. I wonder if that's where a few people have like. Yeah, I mean at got one point stuck. they have to lose the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Abby was really strong in this part of the race. Here we have her in the picture, Elena Roos. Yep, control number thirteen, and then she'll drop down. Yeah, she's lost a lot of time there. So about 30, half a minute to the next control. Let's see if she can beat Kibbutz there. It'll be very tight between the two of them. So I think a Norwegian runner here first, or is it Latvian? Yeah, Latvian runner. But here we have Elena Ros. Doesn't beat the time of Kibbutz into a fourth position. And she's really careful to check maybe the direction out to the next control. Yeah, okay, you're that's right. She, Abby got to the track quite late there. Mm. I think the runability at that point is quite good. Here's Jana Shikova then, throws Jana Shikova into the finish. It's going to be a new second fastest time. Great result, I think, for her. Uh, so about a minute and a half slower than 
Abby at this point. But you can tell that Gemini TV Control 2, she was 108 behind. In the finish, it's 128. So even the last section seems to have been quite good by Mario and Abby. And you see that Sabina Hauswirt has a small disadvantage there. Yeah, she's having to climb up now out of... Uh, can check to get at, to that control, at the control before there. She was actually six six seconds ahead of Mario and Abby. She this control, that control number number six, uh, Abby's just done so well. Yeah. So few people I mean, people we have seen other runners that ha had quite similar mm. times, but there are many runners losing time on this one. You can see, she's just looking in all directions, trying to pick out features in the terrain. And it's 12th position for her at control number six. I was impressed with Halsvitt on um, the relay, so we'll see how she does. Here's Hannah Lundberry. Mm, it's a replay. She was at the second TV control into second position. Mm. So she's not lost too much time in that in that middle section and um I mean she lost she was 13 seconds behind Mario Nabi so about 40 43 seconds she lost there it just puts into perspective uh, Marin Abbey's time and um, how well she's doing how well she did it's uh it's a respeed. yep Good oh, into a second position there eight seconds behind Sara Hagström who is in the lead at this first TV control now three Swedish runners there in the lead. Uh, so she is 15 seconds ahead of Marion Abbey. And Lena Strand into the finish. Can she get into that third place? She's after yeah. some World Cup points. I think she will be there between Janosikova and uh, Berger Lidia. I think starting comparatively uh, earlier than I would have expected, but um, pretty good into third place currently. And here we have a comparison between Abby and Benjaminsen. Benjaminsen going more straight there. Uh, yeah. We can say that the time at control five, uh, Benjaminsen was 47 seconds ahead of uh, Mario Nabi. Yeah, and look, she's gone into a new lead, and that's by 46 seconds there ahead of ahead of Sarah Hagstrom. So she executed that that going straight on that yeah. leg to six. She executed that really, really well. And she was about 21 seconds faster compared to Mario Nabi as well. That is really, really impressive, I think, there. That could be fairly decisive for Benny Minson, I think. And that was her punching that control. Just, you can see her checking the direction, I think, setting a compass and moving on. No hesitations through that control whatsoever. Into the finish, though. That's uh, Shuna Soldini, so it's from the men's race. We're waiting there for Elena, Elena Ross, Ross, I guess. Yeah, here she is. She won't get, be in the top yeah, maybe two, it, but maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe the third. Top three. Uh, we have seen there must have been a mistake there in the middle section by Elena Roos. She was quite close compared to Marion Abbey and then lost time towards the second TV control. Yep, into third spot. Okay, let's have a look here. And we are live then with both of the runners. So we must bear in mind that 
Tova Alexanderson started two minutes after Simona Aversold. And, and Simona Aversold is one gonna minute. Be here. Yeah. So uh, Tova is Catching. quite a bit <laughs> faster there. Yeah, we know from the the control before she was uh, she was quicker by about 49 seconds. Something this ridiculous like that. This is Carol Son, and here we have Hanna Lundberg now yes. switching between the Swedish runners. <laughs> The Swedish runners everywhere, and is she going to take a new second fastest time? I think she will. She has, I think, caught up even more time on Abby in the last few controls. She's snuck a little bit ahead of Jana Shikova. So she goes into the second fastest time then for Hannah Lundberg. She's still a junior, of course, and um, I hope maybe she, I hope she is happy with that. She looks happy with that and um, rewarded with that second fastest time. Let's head back into the terrain, though. This looks like Alexanderson. It is, and we're going to follow her towards the sixth control. Mm, and we also had the punch from Simona Abersol there into the new... She's a new leader there, three seconds ahead of Benjaminsen, but as we saw before, before I think Alexanderson is, will take over. This is Karo Olsson. Yeah, Karo's uh, nearly two minutes down on the leader. Uh, but we will go back to Alexanderson, though who's on her way to this sixth control. She made a really, really good start, even mm. to the fifth control. She pounced there into a new yeah. leading time. 56 seconds ahead of Simona Absolt. So it's looking good for the overall, overall World Cup for Tuve. Yeah, looking really good. But we know Alexanderson can, you know, she makes mistakes. And she's going to have to. Keep, she does sometimes make mistakes, so she's going to have to keep it clean around. I think the ne you know the next few controls are quite tricky. You see, especially some of these ones you see on the picture now. But I think next runner we'll see into TV split two will be Joanna Oberi. So see, taking slightly different lines, a little bit low. Ah, for small 12. mistake there yeah. at twelve. Only it's tiny, a tricky one. but it's, adds, it's you know ten, fifteen seconds or something. Yeah, but she's still she's still up there. I don't know if she has. I think she got it. Uh, it's a tricky one because you get over. You have to get over this on top of the hill, and then it's it's not too easy to see this hole when you just approach top of the hill there. So, Joanna Oberi seems quite low in the slope here. You've got to climb a couple of contours to get to this 13th control, but she does do just that. Into this area, it's a little bit more dense. You can tick off some good features like that boulder. Yeah, you can see she drops over that little spur and then into the control just here. Because it's control number 13. We'll get the time check at the next one. But she's already late. Uh, she was 12 seconds behind Abby at the first TV control. Might have lost another 45 seconds a minute. Here she is. See, she's already maybe just looking to her right, maybe looking at for the next control. That gets Whoa. stuck in the hole there. That's what? a fight with her. With the something, <laughs> fight with a tree. <laughs> Here's Carolyn also though into the finish. And actually, it looks like she's had a really quick descent down into the arena here, because I think she's 
picked up a little bit of time. I mean, uh, she I was say. 148 behind. Oh, but she doesn't TV really realise what's going on. She just needs to keep going. She's not the only one to have done that. You feel like the control should be on the top of the hill and it's around the side, but it's a couple of seconds lost there. But Carolyn Olsen looks like she will go into that third position still, fighting hard here. And actually a really strong end, yeah, strong yeah. finish for, for her. Really she impressive. Was about half a minute faster here on this last section, even though she did this mistake to the last control. I mean, you just a few seconds, but... And here again. Here's a fight with the tree again. You have to have nerves of steel. There's a really steep descent down into the to the railway track. You go underneath the tunnel in the railway. You have to have nerves of steel to take that quickly, and I think Carolyn Austin does. She really does. Now maybe the first to beat Mario Nabi here to the second TV control. Sara Hagstrom. Oh, ah, I was going to say, ah. but maybe she is a mess. She makes Hagstrom. a mess of 12. We'll see. She was 23 seconds ahead of Abby at the first TV control. Let's see what happens. Maybe some of that lost at control number 12, but she's on her way to 13, just looking around. And we'll see, but we know there's, there's time that can be made in those last few sections of the course if she's uh, if she really attacks that downhill slope. It's a skill in and of itself. And you can see there's lots of other runners around her as well. One of, one of those is Maria Lawson, I think, there. She's caught up. Yeah, I think so. Marika Taney as well. So yeah. the big group. Maria Ooh, Larson just punched here. and then Sarah Hagstrom. So Sarah Hagstrom has caught up quite a few people there. I think she is now quite close to Marion Abbey. So she lost some time there at the control before, at control 12. But let's take her to control 14 to the official split time at TV2. Yeah, let's have a look. She drops down. There's a group of three of them. But Marika Taney leading the way there. Uh, she has some kind of guides here in yeah. front of her. And it looks like oh, as long as she wins the battle with the tree. Yeah. Two seconds ahead. Only two seconds ahead. So could be pretty, pretty close. But there's a, they're a fast-moving group of women there. And I don't think Marion <laughs> Abbey can, re can really believe that she's still in this leader's chair. I, when you're an early starter and you go into the lead with, with such a big gap, you, you, you never really quite know how much faster those starting later can go. But, yeah, I mean, um, behind Sada, there were only five starters, so it will definitely be a very, very good result for Marian Abbey. Here she is, so uh, I would say definitely a top 10 for her. Yep, yeah, definitely a top 10. It'll be her best ever World Cup result. And I think her first World Cup run was this time last year, 2021 World Cup final, I think. I'm not sure if it was her first World Cup run. She was very good as a junior and then she had this kind of a break, mm -hmm. came back. I'm not sure about that, but I mean, yeah, definitely the first one after a longer period. Okay, Yona Obe has is looking quick on this last section. She was uh, 111 behind Marion Abbey at the second TV control. It's, be, it's a bit more now. Yeah, the gap's growing a little bit. She will be slower than her teammate Carolyn Olsen. So into the last control and now yeah going to be slower than Yanashikova as well. But I hope she's going to be satisfied with that run. It looks very very good time within those two minutes into fifth position at the moment but we're going to be seeing some of those really so last now, starters including now i think we're going to see a now new. we see a new decisive lead lisa risby 
two top six positions from the most recent Forest World Championships, and she's such a good forest runner. She's going to go well ahead of Hagström here. I think this is looking really promising for Lisa Risby. Here we can see. Has she caught up Sabine Housefit? I yes, think yes. she has. So the immediately good feedback from, from doing that. And then she goes nearly a whole minute quicker than Sarah Hagstrom. 57 seconds. And That's we can pretty also good. Say that uh, Sabine Housefit went into fifth position, 157 behind. So the both of them are very good. So Hagstrom, we can see the GPS tracking. We can see that she's ahead of Marion Abbey. So we. A few moments time we'll see her into this arena here she is descending this slope and it will be a new fastest time finally marion abby's time has been beaten and it's been beaten by sarah hagstrom who looks incredibly strong she's such a great middle distance runner and has put together a really good race a few kind of losses of time maybe in um, round maybe control 13 but she will it will be a quite a decisive lead in the end by over the 30 seconds so Sarah Hagstrom dives for the line pretty much and uh, she really had a fantastic descent because she's managed to get away from those she was running with who are just about to come in the arena right now like Marie Cataney like Maria Olausen so really good last section for her she just kind of maybe put her foot on the gas and managed to break away from that group so and strong and happy very run there. satisfied but let's wait for Andrine Benny means and now because mm. she has a good run going on here as well here she is yeah, yeah. dropping down into this control she and it is a new lead she didn't have the best season so far she struggled in many races uh, if you compare it to earlier years where she was very close to the two big names here Simona Abesold and Tuve Alexanderson but now in this race here it seems that she gets her things together again taking the lead at the second TV control by 32 seconds. And I mean, after her, there, was a, there were only Simon Abersold and to yeah. uh, Alexanderson. So she's gone, um, yeah, she's she's gone quicker. She's gone yeah. a minute and a half quicker than Sarah Hagstrom, who's your new leader at the finish, but Abersold looking good as well. And also quicker than Sarah Hagstrom on the way to the second TV control. Let's see. Yeah. No, we don't see Tuve there yet. I mean, she picked a, one, a minute to control six already but now she it's not there at least no we'll get abasod's time at the next control but it looks like she will have a gap over benjaminson as long as she executes this one correctly let's see if we can spot her coming through the terrain maybe our camera operator has heard her here she is there she goes and that's a good gap as well 37 seconds you can just see these top three runners are just a class apart and now we are waiting for Tuve to the yeah. to the same TV control as we know she was 56 seconds ahead here we have Alexanderson okay. looks good as well maybe a bit faster than Abersold but yeah. not, not a minute anymore I would say no, oh, and she's ah. hesitating into this control. So this is the 13th control that she's on her way to. Losing a few seconds here and there. But her gap was, the gap was yes. so big. 56 Ooh. seconds. Maybe we get back some excitement here, here if she misses the control, punching there. Still in the lead, I guess. Yeah, she will still have a gap over It was over about Abbasold. half a minute to the control, but it's not a minute anymore. No. So Abbasold was quicker in the middle section, I think. But maybe it's, you know, the climb to three, four, five that, that Alexanderson was just so good at. You can see her drop down to get the time check then. And the gap is... It's 44, it 44 seconds. seconds. Yeah. Lisa Risby then into the finish. Can this be a new fastest time to take the lead away from Sarah Hagstrom? 
Oh, it won't yeah. be if she hesitates like this. She needs to keep going. Oh, the second's ticking by. And she's not quite sure where that last control is, but it will be good, I'm sure, for a new fastest time then for Lisa Risby. Sprinting for the line and ultimately those 14 seconds ahead. Oh, congratulations for that. Uh, so how's it managed to get away, I think, in the end, uh, those last stages from Lisa Risby? Into fifth position for Hauswirt. Mm. But a good race by Lisa Risby. Yeah. And there we have Andrina Benjaminsen. Here's Benjaminsen. Yeah, this is going to be a new clear fastest time, I think. Risby maybe had a few problems in the end. But Benjaminsen, with only Abbasold and Alexanderson to come, is our new leader. And her time will be 33 minutes and seven seconds. So Benjaminsen, a strong run from her, I think, maybe going to be back up to one of her better performances. I mean, she and, will definitely yeah. be in the top three today because, as you said, there are only two runners to come. So Benny Minson guaranteed a medal. And she just looked, she, she had a really great long leg to control number six and just kind of kept that high speed. You could see that the way she really wasn't hesitating through the terrain, really strong. And Alexanderson, this is synchronized as ah, if they started at the same time. Is she missing the control there, 15? Maybe. Or maybe she's doing a mistake there, but very soon we should have Simona Abersol to the finish. Yeah, she's but she's doing a mistake back. there. But uh, she should be able to relocate from there. Oh, she, has she got it just dropping down the... Oh, no, she is going back. Yeah, she's going back. Ooh. And I think she will be able to relocate from there because she got the re-entrant there with the stones in it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's going to be close there, <laughs> but I think it's just enough I think to it's get still in front enough. of Abersolt. And I think we'll have Abersolt to the finish very soon. Yeah, I think ah, we really Abersolt will. Abersolt not on the not best, on the best direction line, there. I think. And interesting to see Benny Minson again, like I think yeah. doing what uh, Marion Abbey did and kissing the uh, the, track the track there and yeah. heading down. But Alex Anderson now That's got that safe, control. Still safe. Oh, did Simona Abersold also yeah, make a mistake? Because she should be here, otherwise maybe she's losing yeah. the, the second place here. Oh no! Okay, let's have a look. We will wait. The minutes ticking by. Two minute gap I mean, between Benny Minson and Abersold. Did she also make a mistake? I mean, to that control. It's almost two minutes ago we had. Uh, Benjamins into yes. the finish. She's Look doing at this. This is there. a replay of Abasold. So soon Ooh. we have Alexander to the finish. Here she is. Here she is. So going in, well, going underneath the uh, the railway. So got a few minutes on it together. together now. Oh. Okay. But this means that this I think, I uh, think Benjamins is, yeah. is going to take this second position here. It's going to be tight between. Uh, Risby and Abersold. Oh, it was looking so good for Abersold, apart from number 15. For, in fact, both Alexanderson and Abersold making a mistake, but uh, Abersold's was worse, and now they dropped down into this last control and they've got a few seconds to go. And now we can say that we have the overall World Cup winner here coming to the finish, to Alexanderson. She's going to win this race, I guess. If <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know, we never say never, but I think yeah. uh, it's safe now. Yes, these two world-class runners, the two best orienteers in the world, in my opinion, into the finish together. But Alex Anderson will take the win here. She will take the 100 points. She will be crowned the World Cup champion. But what a great picture to see both of these two runners. They both checked their map there uh, at this last control. But uh, Alex... Abersol followed by Alex Anderson, both into the finish oh, here. But Abersol is and out Abersold, of the top three. She's, yeah, she is out of the top three. And Alex Anderson takes the win. She takes 100 points and she takes the World Cup title. Heartbreak for Simona Abersol, who is in fourth position. Abersol into fifth now. In fifth position, even.
with a mis with a mistake there, close, but. The fight Let's there between these two now the athletes. time is confirmed as well, so no problems with miss punch or anything. So uh, it's official now. It is official. Tova Alexanderson has taken yet another win on the World Cup circuit and yet another overall World Cup title. Doesn't matter. She doesn't even have to race tomorrow in the long distance. And, and she's already taken that World from Cup From our title. spot here, I can also see a very, very happy Lisa Risby about this top three position here. Yeah, she congratulates her teammates as Lisa Risby takes the bronze then. Happy and Andrea Benny in, in the eyes. second. Nice to see. Very happy Lisa Risby about this bronze position. And into sixth position in the end of the race, Marion Abbey. Oh. Has a long time on the leader's chair today. Yeah, and seen very much of Tove Alexanderson's run in the GPS, but uh, except for this mistake, mistake the, in the very end. Yeah. It, I mean, there must have been some struggles in the middle part because she lost a few seconds compared to Abersolt. But otherwise, I mean, uh, yeah, strong performance again, winning this race with 30 seconds. And for Benny Minson, it equals her uh, best ever performance uh, on the World Cup World Championship circuit. She's a silver medalist from the middle distance in the World Champs uh, last year and matches that with another second place here today. I have to hurry up to go to the stop discussing. You have to go to the flowers. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they were checking their split times, but yes, there we can see the gap in the end. It was just 30 seconds between Tove Alexanderson and Andrina Benjaminson. That uh, mistake to the 15th control kind of made that, that deficit, but an even bigger mistake for Simona Abasol put her two minutes behind really? uh, the Swede. But yeah, look at look at how many Swedish runners there are yeah, in that top Swedish 10. Swedish and Swiss runners yeah. in the top 10 here. Then we have the Andrina Benjaminson from Norway and Teresa Janosikova from Czech Republic into this top 10 as well. Okay, we will have the flower ceremony then. So, third place for Lisa Risby, her best ever result on the World Cup circuit. And she I w was very, very pleased with that run. She absolutely deserves that. And Duna Benny Minson, she looks so strong through the terrain and it feels like on what has been a slightly tougher year for her this year. Maybe that's with a, a lot of the sprint races. She's back in that forest terrain and really performing well to get that silver. But Tova Alexanderson takes another win on the World Cup circuit and in fact she has the overall World Cup title with that victory today. She cannot be beaten now. So. Those are the top three. And mis mistakes from a lot of the runners today. You had to try and have as, high, as much high speed as you possibly can, as fewer hesitations as you can. And that ultimately gave you kind of a, a top 10 position. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a quite a difficult race. We have not seen many runners who get, got through without any hesitations or any problems. But in the end, you could get the feeling that it is the runners who kept it together best. I mean, it's we have seen Marion Abbey and she did a very good race all the way. But otherwise, apart from that, we have seen only a few runners without hesitation. We can see Benjaminson with 
a bit of a mistake there to control two, and you can see like the advantage uh, Alexanderson has already at this point, pushing really, really hard here in the uphill. Just the gap she was already able to make to control two. I mean, impressive. we saw that at control six, uh, at control five already, she was about almost a minute ahead of all everyone else. And I think uh, it was about 56 seconds at control six. No, oh, a small loop there, a small problem getting to the hill for Alexanderson. But I mean, it's <laughs> it's a couple can't of really seconds. Really talk, can't really talk about the mistake there. See that the speed stays very high. Yeah, gets a bit lower. Rounding this. Stony part there. Oh, Benny Minson gets stuck yeah. in the stones. But now actually, we, I mean, we were talking and speculating about if there was a small mistake by Alex Anderson on this section here. I don't think so. Only a very short hesitation at control nine, and then here the mistake didn't really matter. But uh, we know now that this control wasn't too easy. We have seen, I think it was quite a good. Uh, approach to go up and kiss that track there to get just this indication where you a, a clear attack point for this control in order to not miss this one mm. i thought maybe I'll, um benny minson had a clean run but actually looking from that there were a few moments of either either hesitation or kind of slightly off the line i wonder you know she's only 30 seconds behind tova alexanderson whether with a really clean run, she would have maybe matched that. Evidently, she, she didn't have as quite as high a, a speed as the but Swede, you know, but you know, but you know. Alexanderson with a very clean run would have been much faster oh, yeah, again. Exactly. So it's it's kind of I don't know. <laughs> it's unfair. <laughs> to, it's unfair to compare someone yeah. uh, who has done mistake with someone who yeah with the time of someone if that person would not have done any mistakes. So it's yeah, yeah of Alex course. Anderson, congratulations to your win today and also to the World Cup overall win. What was uh, your key to success today? Yeah, it, uh, you had to be focused all the time. It uh, was uh, really challenging and fun orienteering. So yeah, I'm really happy with the race. I did a mistake in the end, but before that uh, it was a really stable race. I used to try to be careful with orienteering. When looking to the World Champs next summer, it, see, it seems as your um, this terrain suits you quite well. Oh yeah, I really love this terrain and the environment here with the mountains. So I will really enjoy to train here for the World Championships. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, Tova Alexanderson uh, competing in uh, ski mountaineering as well. She really loves the mountain. She loves training out here. She's good at training at altitude and she's going to be back and wanting to take as many medals as she can, as many wins as she can at the next year's World Championships. But she seemed mostly satisfied with that race. Well, I mean, she kind of confirmed what we were talking about before. It's quite a challenge, a challenging course and you have to be focused all the way. Uh, she had a quite a good race until the end. She lost just that kind of focus for a few seconds and then she did a yeah, about a minute mistake there. But, you know, even a minute's mistake, her speed is still so much better than everybody else's that she can make a, yeah. a mistake like that. Especially in the uphill in the very beginning, mm. you could see that. Yeah, but I mean, she wasn't running yesterday. And I mean, that might have helped her a little bit, especially in this first part when it was a brutal climb there to, towards Control 5. So maybe that was an advantage. Yeah, well, some of the men, especially those starting later, will also uh, have had a similar advantage of not running uh, yesterday's relay. But um, those will be the ones who kind of look towards the end of the start list, those with the, the top uh, world rankings. And of course, more World Cup points on offer for the men's race. They've been starting for the last four four hours pretty much uh, so we already have lots of the men uh, at the at the finish uh, current leader is Eric Langedal Breivik of Norway who actually had a really early start uh, you know maybe not very many world ranking points for him uh, and has performed well to be our still our current uh, fastest time at the finish 
So uh, I'm sure very shortly we'll be able to talk you through the courses there. Maybe we'll chat a little bit about the uh, the, who's leading the World Cup standings for the men. Casper uh, Fosser, he won last year. Uh, he's, again, in, topping the table. Yeah, he's in top of the table. Uh, 222 points for Fosser. Martin Drek won on the second position, 180 points. So it's, it's a bit closer compared to the women's race there for the overall World Cup. Then we also have Gustav Bergman on third with 173. So 49 points behind. I think those are the three runners competing for this overall World Cup title because I I don't really think Tim Robertson <laughs> will make that up. No, no, I don't. You know, he's he's a, such a strong sprinter in tier. That's where he's got a lot of his points from. He's actually in the finish already on fifth position right now. So I don't think he will be in the fight for this overall World Cup. No, no. So it is, it is those top three, and Regborn and uh, Bergman didn't run yesterday's uh, relay uh, at all. So they have those fresh legs. They've also been kind of training in the mountains. Uh, I think Gustav has a kind of bit of a training holiday in in the mountains over in the last month. But uh, it was a few hours ago that they had to check in for the uh, quarantine and just uh, get everything ready. This is actually quarantine at the uh, event center that, that they were in. So just getting all the last minute preparations and ticking in the nerves. They just had to sign in uh, for the sheets there. And, you know, a lot of them have been trying to, will have been trying to relax as much as possible for the last few hours, especially those starting very late and be wanting to try and eventually get into the mood, get into the zone, wake up the body, wake up the mind and um, get ready to perform on this. Uh, they had opportunities to do some kind of training or model maps in the couple of days before it started. Here's uh, Daniel Hoodman just signing in, uh, part of the Swiss winning team. Here's Gustav Berman, fresher, much fresher legs for him. He is in the contention for the overall World uh, Cup for him. I know it's something that he would love to perform on and also get good feedback from... Um, from these races ahead of the World Cup. He would, did take part in some of the, the Swiss selection races, so recent races in here, and uh, maybe thought that he had uh, still a little bit to learn about this Alpine terrain. But I think here today, it's a little bit more Scandinavian. It's going to suit the Swedish runners. It's also going to suit people like Casper Fosser, who we just saw there, who didn't really have the best European champs, but he's going to, uh, I think he will have recovered more from that injury now. This is terrain that's going to suit him a lot more. So 5.4K for the men. Again, estimated winning time of 35 minutes. So we will be able to have a little talk through the course and have a look at, at what challenges. There are a few common controls to the women's course, but actually there are quite a few that are uh, that are different. Let's have a little look. Yeah, it's kind of a similar uh, course as we have seen in the women's race. We start into this in, into this lower part uh, with a small loop here, and this part here down, control two, three, four, and five. This is a really nice section. Uh, good runnability. But I mean, the orienteering is not too difficult. I think it's just, uh, you have to be focused at the start line because there are many controls. You have to change direction, of course, but it shouldn't be any bigger problems. Then we have the climbing, quite similar to the women's race here, control seven and eight. It's not exactly the same control. And then this long route to control nine. It's a similar route, but if you remember the women's course, the control where control eight is here was a bit higher up the hill shouldn't affect the route choice too much here. It's quite a similar approach to this one. But we've seen, for example, uh, quite many runners in the women's race go around, but also, I mean, it, you didn't lose a lot of time if you went straight. We have seen, we don't, I don't think we have seen many fast uh, runners going all the way around on the street. Then a bit higher up here, going towards the map flip here as well at control 13, uh, 14 and 15. Did it, 15 is the hole, it's the control we have seen in the women's race. Quite many of the women struggled there. Uh, 16 and 17, the TV control. Have it in the picture here again. So we see them 
coming from control 16 towards control 17. Then back again. Here we have a section with many shorter controls, many changes in direction. Then we go up down the hill here. With a smaller loop, it's kind of the same thing as in the beginning of the course. It's very open area there. It's kind of easy orienteering, but of course you have to be focused. Uh, there as well and then the downhill it's not the same control at 22 as in the women's race it's a stone there and then towards the finish second last last control exactly the same as in the women's race yeah if you look at the whole course together it's such a very typical uh middle distance course lots of controls lots of changes in direction kind of a little bit of uh different lengths of controls and I think it's going to be really satisfying to run but let's look at 8 to 9 then this longer control slightly different uh, control starting I mean, point from the women but I think we'll see a similar route yeah you better see the first small turn there in the route in the red route you had the women's control so it's a, it's about the same uh, route choice here for the men and the women uh, so we have this option the red option which was quite okay for uh, many of the women. Uh, we also had this purple option here. Also this one was good in the women's race, but I mean it's a bit different. Sometimes you have uh, same route choice for women and men, but it's different in order to which one, which of the options is better for the different classes. It can be that it might be a bit faster to go straight here in the men's race, but we have to wait and see. I don't really believe that the blue option is going to be chosen by many of the runners. I think the straight ones, the, the red one and the one, the blue one are, or the one to the, the purple one, they are quite good in this men's race. Okay, so let's look at the last few starters then on this start list. It's done by the world rankings. So those are the, the most world ranking points will go, of course, towards the end. That's obviously the forest world ranking, the split forest and sprint world rankings. Uh, and then obviously as we, we head later and later, they're going to be the best ones. And we see that Martin Dreekman there, uh, we have him at start number 330. The first one, he's in second position in this overall World Cup. So interesting there. We have Gustav Bergman, 339, and Kasper Foster. Interesting as well. We named it before that Gustav has been, has been running national competitions in Switzerland. And he was very impressed by the performance of Matthias Kiburts because he was kind of dominating the races there. Uh, but he's not here. He's not starting. He's injured. Uh, foot injury. Uh, so uh, they won't see how good he is in that candidate of terrain today. So the fight here will for the victory. I think I see that. I mean, if you look at the results at the moment, we have uh, Norwegian runners on top. And I think this kind of terrain suits them very well. But of course, Gustav Bergman is able to run a technical course like this very well as well. So I think it will be, yeah. If you ask me, I think it will be between Kasper Foster and Gustav Bergman for the victory today. Yeah, so Eric langedahl Breivik was actually the 21st starter. He started super, super early when, if you think, we're now on 115 um, starter. Like, it's it's very, very early to, to, to be impressive and, and have such a great run. And we have Anton Johansson here. It's just one of the examples. I mean, I said that for me, the favourites are Gustav and Casper uh, uh, Foster. But I mean, he's a very good example. Uh, we didn't really have it on the li him on the list at the European Champs. He performed extremely good there. And this is the, the thing in the men's race. You have so many runners who can uh, be in the top three in a race like this. So it's, I mean, of course I pick two of the favorites, but actually we could have like 10 or 15 runners into this top three. So very tight in this men's class. I think even, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, they're, more runners who can be in the top five here in the men's race compared to the women's race. Yeah, absolutely. They're a lot closer in terms of ability and strength. So we'll do a lot of the comparisons, of course, on our GPS tracking compared to Eric Langedale Breivik because he is our current leader at the finish. But we should soon be seeing Aro Ojo into the... Uh, the, I'm going to check. I've got all the control numbers have changed now to the 17th <laughs> control. The TV control number two. They have a little bit further to go. They have the extra loop to do before we see them into the finish. So a few. Uh, it's kind of probably slightly earlier into the course, um, but looking fairly solid there. 
into third place. Mm, and this is the leader, Erik Langedal Breivik. is leading ahead of uh, Anders Haga and uh, very impressive as well. And the third position, Janis Bonek. Kind of a surprise early in this race here. And here we have the route choice to control nine between uh, Robert Merl and Breivik. And you can see it's exactly the same story as in the women's race, the two options run by these athletes here. Yeah, and you can see that uh, Breivik was able to get just as the tail on the GPS was longer, he was able to get a lot further. Here's uh, Gata Steva, though, another Norwegian. I think we're going to be talking about a lot of Norwegians today in the men's race. Louis Capen on the way to the second TV control. Was on eighth position at the first TV control, 30 seconds behind so he's, Aru Aho. Yeah, he's heading into control 16, I still think, yeah, here. And again, this is a he's picture he's not we saw heading a lot into in the, yet. Well, no, <laughs> he is hesitating out on the edge of the circle um, near control number 16. It's really tough. This one, and Catburn had a really good uh, first leg of the relay as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I mean, we can talk about that again. This terrain here, it's a bit special because you have many features on the map and it's, it seems quite clear. And also if you're running, it's quite clear with you. I mean, you see the, the features and everything, It's you can navigate with them. But as soon as you lose contact or you get a bit uncertain about where you exactly are, everything starts to blur out and it's hard to see the features and you could kind of misinterpret like different features and think it's it's something else so it's very easy to make parallel mistakes here and and the visibility also adds to that yeah the visibility i mean it's good and you get the feeling that it's really good and you don't expect to not see features but the, the trees here, they're so dense, so if you if something is just behind a tree, you, you, you have no chance to see through the branches at the moment, and that's, it makes it kind of strange here to run in this kind of terrain. Victor Svensk, though, goes quicker than both uh, Anders Hager and uh, Eric Langedal Breivik by pretty good gap, and part of the, the Svensk <laughs> dynasty, big family <laughs> of orienteers. Um, I'm sure you'll have seen them all competing together, uh, likes of um, some of the major relays, Jukola, Tiamila, those kind of things. And uh, they raced together in a team at the in the relay yesterday. Good result for them. So, mm -hmm. this yeah. Is Mathieu Perrin compared to Breivik. Mathieu Perrin had quite a good Fall season, very strong at the relay at the European Champs and very strong as well at the University World Championships. Switzerland, but in totally different terrain there. It was more this kind of classic mid, uh, midland terrain, as we have seen many times at the World Cup Finals. Maybe not the most enjoyable terrain compared to this one today. So Mathieu Perrin is actually was is still leading at control number eight. So he was ahead of Breivik by 11 seconds. So, but it feels to me like by the time he gets to the control, that lead's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just look at the pure the length of the tails, it shows that in one minute, Breivik has travelled much further than Perrin. I mean, that's interesting because if we compare to the women's race feeling was if you execute the straight one very well, it's slightly faster. It seems here in the men's race, at least at this point, of course, we can't say if Mathieu Perrin is executing it perfectly, but it seems that's a bit faster to go around. Topi Sirilainen then for Finland. Mm, took a bronze medal at the Finnish Championships in middle distance. Now we are with Mathieu forest. Perrin, I guess. Looks like this uh, regarding the running style. So he was 11 seconds quicker than Breivik. Let's see 
what it will be by the time you get to the control itself. You can really see in the terrain here that there are these patches of open. Uh, none of the features are super distinct, but there are these long kind of lines, extraction lines that you can, can use on your way into this you control. And you can really see how he's looking at the map and then lifting his head to try to figure out the different features he wants to see. Oh, good, executed this is very here. Good. Yeah. Did he punch it between the legs? <laughs> Why not? I'm not Anything sure. Goes. Looked like that. So yeah, so he gains about 10 seconds then on that route choice, going straight on. I would have liked to see the punch again. <laughs> Not sure about that. Uh, yeah, take a misstep there. There will be many missteps on yeah. this course. It's a little kind of rocky and in places not it's not too bad, but there are some rocks, some holes, some deeper terrain, some like where there's not very much undergrowth at all on the floor. It's kind of varied. But to get back to this route choice, now we, I think we can say that it's a well executed straight uh, route choice is a little bit faster compared to the other one. So it seems to be the same story as in the women's race. Yeah, it's just you've got to try and back yourself on the execution. Which which of those two routes can you personally execute quicker will be the one that uh, makes it. So here's Martin Hubman. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has a bronze medal from the national championships, but in Switzerland, not in Finland, of course. But also there, it was in totally different kind of terrain, so it's hard to compare them. But he's absolutely wasting no time in setting off quickly here. Let's take a look at then uh, Christoph Meyer's route. How interesting how Climbing straight away. Breivik exited that control. Meyer going up and taking this track, or let's say the tracks, because he's on another track there. I think that's exactly the way you should uh, execute this leg. Get the small track in right in the beginning, but you leave the path, then head over these ridges, get to the next small track just to be sure you're on the, sa on the right height and on the right direction. And then from there you want to go down and there's a small fence after a yellow bit. Ah, now he's hesitating. He was perfectly on the way, but losing the feeling for the distance. Ah, he was so close. He was so about, close. He was about 20 seconds um, behind uh, Peran going earlier Going back on. again. Uh, this is what you've been saying about it. When you go slightly wrong, it's hard to relocate and get those and, precise details. And the details. thing is as well, you come from this first bit, which is a bit longer for the men's race, and their runnability is really good. So if you change into this more stony area, you have to adjust your feeling for distance because it will slow you down. So you have, you have to be flexible. And of course, that happens in many terrains. But here it seems really that he but lost confidence. The change confidence is very subtle, though. Like it's often when you go between different terrains, your speed changes like quite a lot. You know, maybe we saw that at the European Championships. But here, it's it's quite subtle, I think. So Aro Aho into the finish. Yeah. And he has lost, I think, some time in this last part of the course. Yeah, he really has. He was actually much closer to Breivik after the second TV split and lost a lot of time right here in the end. What is it about finish orienteers and running in shorts? There's definitely something here. <laughs> but in fourth position there at the moment. The gap is one and a half minutes. It's really a terrain where you can run in shorts, so it's no it's no thorns and higher bushes, so why not? The, the weather's fine. So Victor Svens into the finish here. And this looks, yeah, this will be clearly a new best time, I think, in the finish here for Victor Svensk. Mm, together with Loi Capen. This is a very, very good race by Victor Svensk. Really setting down a mark here, gritting his teeth and 
setting a very fast time. Uh, oh, yeah, let me here. just check here. They, there are, I'd say most runners have had a little check of their map there because you feel that the control should be on the hill. It's just kind of off the end of the hill. But anyway, it doesn't yeah, I mean, affect it Maybe too that, much. but I mean, there it's marked, so you just follow the marks. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah, I kind of understand it, but I don't understand but it at the same time. But then also, if you think it should be there and it's not there and you go, where's the control? But I, I don't think it's the problem that you think it's on the hill. I think the problem is that you kind of overrun the finish and start to run away from the spectators again and then have to turn, but you don't see the turn before the hill. Uh, let's see the comparison here. Thomas Krivda and uh, Victor Svens, the leader in the finish on those different routes. Let's see here. Krifta was... He's very high up in the slope at the moment. He was about 10 seconds behind. Svens gets control 8. Okay, let's check by the time he gets the ninth but, control. But of course we will compare the time to Mathieu Perra, the leader at this point there. So there we had Krifta. About 26 seconds behind. Seems to me that he might have lost a few seconds, but let's take him to the... Ah, maybe not. Let's take him to the control. There we go. It's very close to it. Maybe you can see it. Ah, it's a bit faster. Three seconds faster. Four Pretty seconds. good start. He had a good... Uh, I think he ran the final leg for the, the Czech team yesterday in the relay. Looks to be pretty strong on that team. So let's compare Lucas Leland now. Leland was actually in the lead at Control 8. Uh, 28 seconds ahead of Viktor Svensk. So Leland is going straight here. He's really glued to this red option as the course planner <laughs> predicted it. Now heading down, maybe a bit, a bit early there. Looks good for him. Uh, you can use there's a very obvious like fence yeah. enclosure. You can use to just check your height. It's like a, a a super nice thing to see on the way because there's like about three of them on the map. So it, it just gives you a. It's almost like taking a control there. It gives you the confidence of going well. There's nowhere else I can possibly be. Uh, it's it's fun. It's interesting to see that they, at what points they have the map contact because every one of them had it at exactly the same points just before you get on top and start to run down again. But now it seems to be a bit off direction. A little bit high Standing here. There. Oh. Doesn't see the control, but he sees the cameraman. Now he sees okay. the control. <laughs> a small time loss here, about let's say five to ten seconds. But still four seconds ahead. Uh, so we are 12 seconds ahead at control eight. Now it's five seconds left. So again, maybe losing just those few seconds right at the end. But but as you're saying, those that route choice is so similar. Yeah, it's very similar. But it seems that it's a little bit more difficult to execute if you come straight to the control because if you don't get the features right in the very end then uh, we see them hesitating here's a big group yeah so we're looking at robert yeah. merle who's the quickest in this group he's the one at the back but you can see he's caught up michaela lejnik who's ahead he's got up uh, Yunus aula i think as well yeah and pascal books as well yeah. uh, so <laughs> this group who were all started two minutes apart uh, all together, and the the one who's caught them all up is Robert Mel. So good one for him. Okay, let's head back to the start then for Max Petterbeimer. Mm, was taken out of the competition yesterday due to the mispunch of Isaac uh, von Krusenkerner. Was tenth at the European Championships in the Middle Distance. And uh, he was also in the team that won the relay. He was indeed. 
But we'll talk about some more Swedes now. From one Swede to some more Swedes. Here's two, two, other Swedes. Two, more, two other Swedes. So, Victor Svensk compared Anton to... Anton Johansson, silver medalist to European Championships. Maybe, I mean, if you go straight there, you want to, to hit that small track there, a bit to the west of where he is at the moment. So he gets into this slope a bit high. I wonder if he will be able to notice that because now he doesn't get help of this fence there. Mm. And if you just get in there without any clear attack point, it's very hard to, to relocate. And I think he's off track. I don't think he has control over the situation there. So maybe for him it would be the best to just overrun it and get to this track behind, follow it down. Um, but seems as if he's stopping there now. It's, oh, that will be interesting to follow because it's hard to relocate at this this part. Maybe you see, see the stone, the boulder there, just in, under the ring, control 12. But he's hesitating. Now he's, ah, this is, ah, there is a risk that he will lose a lot of time there. And I mean, that's what I mentioned before, that if you execute this straight route well, then it's fast, but there's a bigger risk of doing a mistake if you're not 100% accurate in executing it. Yeah, you can see the time dropping down very, very quickly now. And he's still not, yeah. I think, in quite control of the situation. It's hard. If you know you've got to drop down, but you don't know exactly where you are in that slope, trying to attack this control is really hard. He's spending a lot of time looking at his map. And this must be a... This is, this is what you say of to relocate. If you can't relocate where you I are, mean, look you have to move. look around here. You don't see so many no. features, even though you have the feeling that visibility is quite good. It's hard to spot the features and even the contours. And the tricky thing is as well that if you have the cameraman around you, you usually think that you're close to the mm -hmm. control or at least on the way to the control, but he doesn't know in which direction to go from there. This is Boyan Blumenstein for Germany. About a bit more than two minutes behind. Into 11th position at that second TV control. Here he is in the picture. Yeah, the best of the Germans, but down in 11th position at the moment. And uh, Victor Svensk is just going to be enjoying his time in the leader's chair. His time still stacks up pretty well, if you're looking at the earlier split times. Ah, this is Mathieu Perrin, but he lost time there. It yeah. was five seconds behind at control nine at the first TV control. Now it's more and than a minute. He was ahead of Victor Svensk, but now yeah. behind. Yeah, lots of small mistakes, I think, then on some of these small, tricky controls. Small and big mistakes. Small and big mistakes, yes. So you can see the gap there back to the leader. So he was ahead of Victor Svensk, but has lost all of that distance. Head back to the start for Timo Sild. Quite an experienced runner, 24th. The Middle East and at the European Championships on, ho on home soil. Yeah, it's fair to assume that it, that was his main aim for the season, was those home European Championships. And in quite different terrain here. Let's look at Christoph Meyer. Yeah, we've seen him do a mistake there towards the... Uh, on this long leg, but it seems to be that he has kind of found back a rhythm here. Running quite okay in this section here. Compared to Viktor Svensk. He was about 27 seconds behind that control at the TV one. Ah, but he loses time here. But I'm not sure if he's on the right direction here. 
No, we can feel the, the camera's kind of looking for him. Uh, it's a pity for him. He's there always doing a mistake when he's in the picture. Yeah. So we have lost about 20 seconds here between the pre-warning and the TV control. Yeah, actually dropped a couple of places as well, down mm -hmm. from fourth into sixth. So, and when you have a few of those, they just add up and add up. So the forest looking maybe a little bit emptier now as we've had all of the women finish. Gonna insane is the next to start, the Austrian. Again, a lot of experience. Yeah, if you compare compare Silt to Imsen, then it's unfair to talk about the experience <laughs> regarding Silt. <laughs> There's much more experience in uh, Imsen. Here's Robert Mel then into the finish. This is looking pretty good for the Austrian. He was in that whole group of four, but I wonder if he's dropped them. No, he's uh, kind of Eunice Ola, I think, is there as well. There's a whole group kind of running together. But Robert Mel was the one who's caught them all up. So let's see what he is able to do in terms of his finish time. One last hill to climb, very small one, and then rounding this corner. And there's lots of support there. Again, nah. just checking where the control is. There's just something uninstinctive about that control. I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. But Mel has had a fantastic race here and is able to finish in fourth place just ah, one he second. He lost one place there yeah, when he he's did. looking for the last control. It's a pity, but otherwise a good race here, good performance by Robert Mel. We have Ricardo Scalet, uh, one of the runners, talked about it yesterday, who is familiar to do good races in the middle distance at, for, at the World Cup final. Had his first top three position a year ago in Italy and home soil in the middle distance. But unlikely to be a repeat performance yeah. today as he drops down the rankings. Here we go, a lot more direct. You could just see the direction of entry from that control was just a lot more direct than Maya. Okay, back to the start then, Florian Hovald. Struggled yesterday physically uh, in the uphills, but uh, good for him. There's not that many, uh, there's no such big uphill as it was yesterday. Of course, there are meters to climb here, but they're, they're well spread out over the course, it's, yeah, except for the first climb. But I think otherwise, I mean, that's that's doable. There's still 300 meters of climbing yeah, in but the I mean, 5.4K. Yesterday you had 170 in just one bit. Yeah. Uh, so today it's that's totally different thing when you get to recover in between. Because Leland, who was the leader at the first TV control, now on the way to the second one. Yet see him, seen him hesitating a little bit just before the control there at the first TV control. I think he's alongside Thomas Krivda. Are they going too far mm. down the slope now? Is what they, they feel maybe it's too far, too low. So we'll go straight past the running cam, back up this slope. Yeah, I think it was nearer control 17 than 16. It's hard to tell. It's kind of the Meyer syndrome here doing the mistakes every time he's in the picture. Ah, he's, you could hear him swearing. He's not really in control over the situation. You can see that. 
Drifta is not either in control over the situation. No, let's take Blumenstein to the finish, though. And uh, hopefully by the time we've done that, then Leland would have found the control. It's such a shame because he was uh, leading at that first TV split. But Blumenstein, the best of the Germans, is... Maybe looking for a top. He's the best of the Germans so far in 16th position, Erik Döhler. Four minutes behind, so he'll definitely definitely beat Döhler here. Will probably be just outside the top 10, or it's going to be close. And into equal 10th spot there, equal with Matthias Peter. Okay, let's head back into the terrain. This is Mathieu Perrin. Again, we'll take him to the finish. Again, Mathieu Perrin, we saw some mistakes. He dropped down the list after a fast start. But more than two minutes down now. So Mathieu Perrin, It'll be seventh for him. And after a fast start, not quite as good. OK, Joey Haddon. Now then, let's see what Joey Haddon can do. He's got two uh, wins in World Cup middle distance races, one of those being in Switzerland, but in very different terrain. And we saw his strength and his speed yesterday, especially up that hills, was very, very impressive. And I mean, uh, um Six, I think six years ago, we had the Junior World Championships here around. It's quite similar to rain in the middle distance when he could win the race. So he has proven before that he can run good, even if it's technical orienteering. I mean, the, that he has the physical uh, strength that have we have seen yesterday. Yeah, and Joey won the uh, long distance that year, second in the middle distance, won the relay, won the, uh, the sprint. So... Six years ago, home junior world champs was very, very good for him. That's Christoph Meyer on the way to the finish. As we mentioned before, did his mistakes when he was in the picture. So let's hope he's not doing a mistake here now. That would be pretty impressive to. I mean, to we have do. seen mistakes oh, here yeah, towards yeah. the last control. Yeah, we have. But able to fly down this hill. And race hard here. The Swiss crowd will cheer him into the finish. But it will be more than two minutes down. Again, a little just short yeah, but We stop. can't call that a mistake here. No, no. <laughs> Not in comparison to what we've seen some other people do. The Swiss flags are out. And. Was that even a check of the time or something? Or check I of the, think it checked check the, 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 the punch. Yeah. Worked and eighth place ultimately for him. Did we get the punch of Lucas Leland in the end at the second TV control? Yeah, we got it into ninth position, one minute and 22 behind Viktor Svensk. So he lost about one and a half minutes there. This is Elias Kuka, who uh, missed the final at the European Championships, but then got a medal in the long distance. So the middle distance final, of course. Compared here to Viktor Svensk on the straight route, you can see that he got this small track there. Now he gets the fence there, so he's in a good way towards the control. This looks like it's well executed. Mm, we have seen many runners just stopping shortly before the control. It's always here where they take the map contact again. Yep. Which he Just does go exactly the same. Over this small open area. Then have to drop down to the control. 
That looks good. Yeah, it looks really good. Could see another runner there in front. Yes, indeed. Punching there, yeah. Well executed, 23 seconds behind. And you can see slower than Leland and Perrin, but both of those now made it to the finish after making mistakes yeah. further he, along. So he lost three fast. seconds on this leg compared to Leland, but Leland had some hesitation as well. Ricardo Scalet then into the finish. And again, a lot of those around a similar time, two minutes slower than our leader. And maybe he's, a, you know, there's, there's a lot of teams who will be using this as kind of almost like a bit of a training camp, trying to get feedback for, it's, I know it's not the same, quite the same terrain as we'll see in the World Championships next year, but it's, there are some similarities. We'll get a lot of feedback and, and try and use that information for next year. Yeah, I mean, you have to simulate this. Maybe it's not the terrain that's perfectly suited to next year, but you have the mappers and you, I mean, the whole organization of the feeling at the arena. So the start for Eskil Shinneberry is looking nice and controlled. You can just see the amount of map contact that he's got there uh, on this first section. And we're now into the last of the 10 last runners. We just ha had Martin Regborn start. We should keep quite a close eye on him as much if we can, because he is in contention for the World Cup overall. This is the mascot for the next year's World Championships. Ah, oh, it's a mascot. Yeah. I thought it was a, a normal spectator. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Current standings, though, Victor Svensk has still quite a decisive lead. Uh, but the, the mascot is, is actually it's a local animal, like it's very famous for the region here. It's called a Steinbock in German. It's kind of a, a deer with big horns, a mountain goat with big horns. Okay, let's look at Wojtek Kral, comparing that with our current leader. Not the leader, though, at control number nine, but our current leader at the finish. So Wojtek Kral was ahead at control number eight. Drops mm -hmm. quite low here. It was 18 seconds ahead. But we've seen quite many runners. When they were in a good position there, it's fast. You can see the fence now. That's what we were talking about. Of course, that control is not his control. It must be from the national competition. He's only 20 seconds left now from here. Uh, of course, this is compared to Leland and not to Viktor Svensk. Richter Svensk is 33 seconds behind Leland. So still a few seconds left. And here we have Leland to the finish. Yeah, here he is, Lucas Leland. We saw, unfortunately for him, make that mistake at control number 16. It really dropped him back because he's still our leader at TV control number one. So a story of nearlies for Lucas Leland. And he's going to go into fifth spot, I think. Yeah. Equal fifth spot, but there's, you know, it felt like a, a minute, minute and a half, maybe he dropped in that, in that, just that control number 16. So, uh, close one for him. Here's Wojtek Kral. Yeah, into sixth position, 29 seconds behind. Um, Ahead of uh, Victor Svensk, though. But he lost 19 seconds compared to Lucas Leland on this route, and Leland didn't have a perfect execution either. No, he's not happy. Yeah, you can you can see really that he didn't see. have a perfect race. No, and and actually, 
when most of your race goes well, but you yeah, yeah, absolutely mess up one of the controls and you know it's, it's very a annoying. nearly a story of nearly, that is that is kind of the worst feeling, right? Luca Basse. We haven't really seen much from him this year so far. No, but being more of a forest specialist. Yeah, of course. You you get that. So for him, it's all about the, the forest season next year, the world championships next year. So getting the feedback uh, from these kind of races is probably where his focus lies. He, I think he gave the sprint a good go, but his heart really lies in, in the forest mm. races. This is Martin Hoopman compared to Viktor Svensk. Martin Hoopman was 158 behind Lee Lanto at the first TV control. So it was about uh, 1 and 20 behind Viktor Svensk. You can see almost here there's a, like a good line of visibility for him. I think he, yeah, stayed quite high. Climb, you could see him climbing up the slope and then just dropping into this control. And actually, that execution's pretty good. Mm, but now he has to get to the TV split at the next control. So he's losing time here. He lost time from the first TV control to the second one as well. But. Quite exactly two minutes behind. And now, of course, it's compared to Viktor Svensk. So, just about another half minute here between the first and the second TV control. Yeah, this is the reason why Lucas Leland is not happy. Just a reminder, that was his mistake at control 16. And he knows he knows we'll have all been watching as well. Just the worst feeling when you know the rest of your race has, has actually been pretty strong. Very tough. So Victor Spence still in the lead, but loads of the best runners. Our favourites still to come, still to start even and, and make their way around this 5.4k course. 300 metres of climb. It is uh, steep and tricky, and but the forest, I mean, we, we ran there a couple of days ago. It is it's really satisfying to run in the forest. It just feels uh, very runnable and very open. And, yeah. and actually, we don't often get that on a... World Cup circuit. I mean, often in the World Cup, you get if you have good visibility and if it's you, you, it's a kind of terrain where you get a good flow, it's often not too difficult mm -hmm. to run in. So the difficulty is often due to lower visibility, as we had it in Estonia. And um, of course, then when you got to a terrain here where you never on the whole course get the feeling that I get stuck or anything. <laughs> of course, there are some stony parts in between where it might be slowed down a little bit but it's very enjoyable to run here but you have to be very careful to not lose contact and contact to the map and I, I mean that's the difficulty don't us underestimate the the course yeah it's really deceptive it's 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 you you get lulled into a false sense of security and then it can all go wrong and as we see uh Ruslan Glibov here in the picture we also got to Anton Johans onto the finish. He did a big mistake. We've seen the beginning of it. Mm. Now he's about four and a half minutes behind into 27th position. So a big time loss there. Oh, here's a mistake. Zach von Krusenkerna. Yep. Mistake into the 13th control. You could see he was just really low on the slope. This is Martin Rekban, right? 
Where is it from Cruz and Cuerna? No, it's, I guess it's from Cruz and Cuerna. Yes, it is. Yeah. Kind of the similar head bent there. But of course, if you see the recap of von Cruz and Cuerna, there's no reason to show the eggbone later no. on. <laughs> but actually, maybe we're going to focus on Elias Kuka, who seems to be doing a bit of a better job. Uh, von Cruz and Cuerna. Yeah, we saw that mistake into the 13th control and mm -hmm. maybe losing some bits of time. Kuka, but Kuka was in third position at the first TV control and uh, he was nine seconds ahead of Victor Svensk there. Seems to be that he has a chance, he seems that he could have a chance here. But let's head back. Keep you updated from the splits. This is Emil Svensk. Emil Svensk won the Swedish Championships in middle distance quite recently. Okay, so Tippi Sirolainen, we see towards the finish. Yes, it is. Looks like he's caught up Rudolf Sternis and really working hard here. Let's see what's happened. but it could be a new third best time here for Sirolainen. Haven't seen much of him around the course, but not too many time losses compared to Victor Svens, so rewarded with third place. Mm, this is Joey Adorn. I think he's on the way to the first TV control, and as you can see there, we have a new, new leader at the first TV control. Oli Oyanao, five seconds ahead of Leland. So let's have a look. So you can see he was quite a long way ahead at the control number eight, then has gone this more direct route. Can feel the self-confidence he has from yeah. yesterday. I'm not sure if he will see the fence from where he is now. Maybe. Ah, hesitating here. That's not good. That's the problem. When you get too low into this uh, slope there, it's much more difficult to do the final navigation towards control. But it's a good sign that he is stopping and trying to relocate on this open line there because it's much easier to do there than just run into the forest and try to do it there. There at least you have an indication about the, the distance where you are and you just have to find out where on the slope you are as well. Still 15 seconds left in order to take over the leads. That can tell you at control go. 8. He was in the lead, uh, 28 seconds ahead of Oyano, so he lost about 23 seconds here now, but still in the lead. So you can tell his speed is high, but few too many mistakes. He's got to try and regroup from that mistake and just. Uh, Regain control, I think. Wojciech Kral neck and neck here with Victor Svensk. Let's see, maybe mm. slightly ahead. Let's see what the time check is like when we actually get to control 17. They were neck and neck already at the first TV control. Only four seconds between those two runners in advantage to Wojciech Kral. It might be still about the same, maybe a bit, few more seconds now. And here we have Martin Uppmann to the finish. Yes, Martin Hubman, Lord of the Hubman fan club there to cheer him in, making all the noise. But again, about for two minutes behind. It's hard to know whether he'll be satisfied with the performance today. 
Try to see his reaction. But heading Maybe back. Maybe not too happy. Here's Wojtek Kral, and we could see on the GPS tracking that him and Svens were really very close together, but now a few seconds behind. It's going to drop into the 17th control very shortly. Just could hear some runners. Ooh, it looks like he's lost no, a little bit more time. I wonder if there was a, a small mistake somewhere. I've had him punching uh, at control uh, yeah, 16. Yeah, he comes so into this control from, a, from the right. 17. That's not the most direct way. I lost 17 seconds here between control 16 and 17. And here we have Daniel Hoopman, the starting line. Fourth at the Swiss Championships in middle distance. A very good performance yesterday on the first leg for the Swiss team. Yeah, I was really impressed with his performance. Okay, so now we have him here, Martin Rijk Born. Second in the overall World Cup at the moment. Oh, that looks oh, very good, very smooth that looks here. Really good. Into third position at the first TV, 10 seconds behind. Here we have it. Yep. That is, pr that is close enough for me at this point to, to still put him in good contention by the end. Really well executed route on that long control. And of course, he's, he's on fresh legs. He didn't run uh, yesterday, uh, as well as Gustav Bergman. So we'll see if that helps for the climbs. Mm, I'm sure it will. We have also uh, Albin Riedefeld, who didn't run yesterday, the European Championship uh, champion. He's out there as well. We haven't seen him starting. Here we have Gustav Bergman, third in the overall World Cup. And second last starter, is winning the silver medal at the Swedish Championships in middle distance just a few weeks ago. Yeah, and he's after another World Cup win. Here we have Shinneberg and Viktor Svensk. Shinneberg into eighth position at control eight. You could tell he was slightly ahead of Svensk. Mm -hmm. Not by loads. Oh, in nine seconds. But he just looks a bit, a bit slow. You can see in that in that rocky section. Yeah, you can also uh, see that he, he, he didn't hit the track there very good, but I think there might be still an advantage for him. You can see how he's running down this uh, this open part using that as a line feature. Now going to cut down into the forest. You can really do that if you're going to approach that control from above. And yeah, pretty good into this control. That's what we like to see. And smooth mm -hmm. through the next one as well. To sixth position, 35 seconds behind Joey Hadorn. Looks like he's got a bit of tape on his neck. I haven't seen something like that before. Okay, here's our last starter though. It is Kasper Fossa. He is defending World Cup overall champion and leader in the current standings. He's also the reigning world champion in the long distance and in the sprint distance. We'll see whether he, what he can do. Back to the forest though. Elias Kuka on the way to the finish. Kuka was third at the second TV control, 40, no, 38 seconds behind. Here we have Kasper Foster again. And uh, if we look at the runners who have finished the race yet, we see that the Norwegian team did a great job. So I think this terrain suits them well. I mean, just look around in the forest. It's not hard to guess that the Norwegians will like this. Uh, but he has been running yesterday and his closest uh, opponents, they haven't done it. So it will be interesting to follow that. Elias Kuka just checking where the control is again. Uh, but can he get into second fastest time? I think yeah, he, he can. Lost, yeah, he can, but he lost a few seconds here from the second TV control to the finish. Yeah, uh, there's quite a, a little heap seconds. of controls, of, of tricky short controls um, in this last section where there's 
I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to win and lose time. Mm. But let's That's interesting. Kier Mula. Oh, and we haven't seen this way before. Oh, that's the uh, Finnish champion going there. Actually, quite a good. Yeah, kind of similar, I guess. Kekirimla, 23 seconds behind Hadorn. Let's see, he was 18 seconds behind Hadorn, but then we know as well that Hadorn had this hesitation there. So maybe about 15, 20 seconds slower this option here, or a bit more. That's quite a risk to take that option. I mean, you know, you know, you know, Swiss terrain yeah. is going to be looking for route choices. I mean, You're actually going to be looking for routes to go quite a way off the line. It but depends that feels... on how you define risk because it's a lower risk to miss the control. But That's I mean, true. it's a yeah, it's it's far around. And I mean, from the first controls, you should know that straight going straight is kind of always an option. So if you're unsure about the route, then just go straight. Here we have Oyanao compared to Svensk, and uh, I think we're going to have a new leader soon at Control yeah. 16. But I mean, we yeah. have seen people who got off direction there in this area where he is right now. It's kind of a new cotton area, so they were doing some woodwork there. A few trees lying on the ground. Now we are with Oli Oyanao. Feels like it m might be something of a breakthrough season in the senior ranks for Olio Yanaho this uh, year. He was uh, sixth place in the long distance at the European Championships. You know, multi junior world champion. Um, but unlike, you know, someone like Casper Fosser or Simone Abasol, ha wasn't immediately able to transfer that to the, the senior competition. Uh, very nice to see for the Finnish team that they finally get the runners on this very good positions in the World Cup races. It's kind of important for the sport to have Finland back there. Yeah, and it still looks good. Yeah, yeah, him. and I mean, he's into a clear lead here at the pre-warning. So let's take him to the 17th control. Yeah, it looks like a a really good straight line into this control as long as he can spot it here really strong so we'll take a new leading time here by 42 seconds it was 44 seconds at the first tv control but still i mean they go qu it's quite equal there but look at this oh. Adon with a lot of confidence after yesterday's race so that off direction oh. there yeah it's, it, the feeling is that he is pushing really hard because he knows about his physical strength. But then maybe overdoing it a little bit in some parts. Guess we will have him in the picture soon. Had on the leader at the first TV control. 44 seconds ahead of Svensk. That might be... About the same, maybe a bit more now. I'm sure we'll pick him up on the, the pictures really, really soon. I don't know if the cameraman made it back. Yeah, to make it back up the hill. Yeah, it just followed Oyanao. Here he is. <laughs> It'll be tough for the cameraman to close that gap. <laughs> Ah. Oh, but he's looking around again. It's the same. It, it, we had that before, the runners who always miss when the cameraman is around. It's going back up the hill. Mm -hmm. Oh, tough. And we'll, we'll catch up on that in a bit moment. Let's get quickly the finish of Wojtek Kral, who will be outside the top three, but not by much. Good result for Wojtek Kral, who's probably better known as a sprinter, but back towards Joe Haddon. That, oh, yeah, is, that is a 16th control. Ah, but he might have lost quite a few seconds there. I don't yeah. think he will take over the lead. Maybe into second position, if he finds that control without any problems. Let's follow him down this slope, try and pick up so he will be slower than the Finn. Here he Where is, is dropping it? down this hill. You can see he's trying to look out and keep his balance you can see now here in this part it's more stony there are trees lying on the ground it's more difficult to run so we know he's got high speed 
but it's making mistakes has, out his here. His speed is just a bit too high. It's a little bit too high. You can see this kind of headless chicken I going mean, around in circles a little bit. For him, it, it feels sometimes that it would be that he is always giving it 100%, but and sometimes you feel that it would be more effective to just give it 97% instead. So now we are with Martin de Riekborn. Control 15, I don't know why we still oh, compare. It's still a little mistake, I think, into 15, it's hard to tell. And we still compare to the leader in the finish, not the leader at that point of the race. Victor Svensk. Getting out there, Ex exits that control quite low. Always going down a bit in the slope, he has to climb. 10 meters though, or 15 meters, no, 10 meters. Now getting up there again. Ah, you see, it's quite yeah, low. Yeah, he's quite low here. down. We have seen some people who take the climb quite late. It still yeah, feels I mean, as, as long as you're aware of the situation, yeah. it's not a problem, but he has to get back up there. He's dropping and it down feels even more. that he is going down more. Ah. That's not, yeah, you could get that feeling straight after the control already. I'm losing a few seconds here. Definitely not going to make it to the TV, second TV control in time because he hasn't been at the pre warning yet. Here's the pre warning. Oh, so he wasn't too far off. Uh, it's, but it's about half a minute from yeah. here to the next control. So he lost, yeah, I would say. I mean, he was in front at the control before, so he lost about 40, 45 seconds. More than had on, I guess. So he'll be slower than had on and into third position. Not many runners now still to come. We've had everybody start. Let's have a look at Emil Svensk. Mm, now we have the Svensk brothers compared to each other here. They go different routes. Looks good, you can see he hit the track, he hit that fence. It's all good so far, seems to be on direction here still. Has to drop a bit of and ground, I mean, but not too much. Compared to Viktor Svensk, he has quite, there's about 40 seconds more. He was 40 seconds behind Hadorn, so there's, few seconds left here. We also know that Hadon did a mistake later on. You can also see that Alvin Riede fell punch there into second position. Yeah, pretty good. Mm -hmm. So it's a good start for Alvin Riedefeld, the European champion. Close call here between Schindeberg and Svensk. Let's see how he will exit. I like that when they head towards this boulder there because it's, it's quite open there. You can see it and it gives you kind of the direction. You just have to lift your head and take it. And then from there, you have to climb a little bit. And then it, as, exactly as uh, Victor Svensk did it, really much like that. And you got this yellow bit there. And then the control is quite easy. You just fall down behind this. Um, spur there, just the west of the control. The feeling, the feeling is that Shinabari loses a few seconds here, just on this control to control on the way to control 16. Yeah, just checking the map a lot. Just trying to drop down into this control again. If you're looking for that spur, it's hard to see in, in there. But there we go. Adapting well to the slight changes in visibility. Mm -hmm. But we'll take the time at the next control, of course. You can see here is the comparison to Svensk, Victor Svensk. Have to soon start to call them by their first name as well. Soon we will have uh, Emil there as well, or in a few minutes. Okay, so Eskild Shinnebury in 
equal in fifth spots, so very close to Wojciech Kral. But I think we're going to be heading towards the finish. Here's Oli Anaho. Is it going to be a new leading time? I think it really will be for the Finn. He doesn't seem to have made too many mistakes around there at all, not from what we've seen on the GPS tracking. He's going to round the corner to the last control, and it will be a clear new lead for the Finn. He lost a few seconds compared to Victor Svens from the second TV control to the finish. A new best time then, just over the 35 minute mark. Mm. So maybe not completely clean, but that was pretty impressive. And I think, yeah, maybe it cements this as a, a, a bit of a breakthrough year, I think, for him. Evidently in really good shape. Let's have a look at Joey uh, Haddon. Haddon. Is there another mistake? Not a good sign here if you see him. This, uh, I, I don't like this. He should get a bit more to the left there, down to control 19. You get really much help of this yellow line leading you almost all the way to the control. So it seems that he is like overdoing it a little bit, trying to do a bit too much. This is Daniel Hoopman now. Yeah, let's really get, will struggle soon with all the different brothers here, but yeah. with only the, the last name in the graphics. So Daniel Hubman, yeah, clear, good, uh, well executed route uh, here. You should, you should actually be in compi uh, comparing him to Oya now, mm -hmm. and not to Svensk anymore. Yeah, a new leading time there, really good, really strong for Daniel Hubman, who. You can see just with the ease he was able to execute that very direct route choice uh, to control number nine. It was very impressive. But let's now look at Gustav Bergman, who's gone low. Ah, He's gone good. round in it looking good. He looks was good. the fastest to the eight control as well. It was three seconds faster compared to Joey Hadon. And compared to Hoopman, he was 32 seconds faster. If you take it, Oyanaho was half a minute behind. So we will see him on the picture very soon and we'll get that comparison to Daniel Hoodman who's just taken the new leading time at control number nine. I think we have to wait a few seconds until we get him into the picture. So the cameraman following Hoodman all the way to the control. <laughs> but you can see a clear clear lead if you compare to Oyanaho, who's our new well, leader at the finish. You can see now the, following the cameraman on the way back finding Beriman. Ah, is it the, just double checking here. Checking the features on the way, like that. You can see how he turns his head, tries to check off the things he wants to see. The lead, as we said, at uh, control eight compared to Hoopman, 32 seconds. So he lost time here. It's actually quite a few seconds. Hoopman with a very good leg here. Yeah, but he's going now very directly into this control. So I mean, will it Hoop still be leading time? Hoopman was also about 28 seconds faster compared to Hadorn, so good. Good execute, well executed there, six seconds only. So, yeah, Daniel Hoodman's route to that control number nine, oh, really, very good, very like good, the, yeah. the best, the best I route mean, maybe not the route, maybe but the execution. The execution. Here's Joey Hadon, and maybe it's a tale of what might have been for Joey Hadon, because the speed is evidently there. But I've made note of mistakes at control number 9, 15, 16, 19 as well. And it's just pushed him out of a metal place at the moment. It's such a shame for Hadon because he evidently had the speed, maybe going a little bit too fast for his orienteering. And he will, in the end, be in that fifth or sixth position. Sixth position for Hadon. Oh, I mean, potential. yeah, of course, he missed quite many times here and I think he would have had the potential to be up higher up in the result list but still it's it was one of the better performances this year and uh, here we have Martin Regborn on the way to the finish looking much better for Martin Regborn that will be tied for the second position it will he did we saw him make a mistake at control number 16 though and maybe that's gonna 
put Price. He's really after those points in uh, contention with Gustav Berman, contention with Kasper Fosser as well. But it will be third place for him at the moment, just behind Victor Svensk. So third place for Regborn with a mistake in there. Not too many though. And a third place back to the forest though. Yeah, we're waiting for Riedefeld on the way to the second TV control. He is punching there. It's quite a good time. The European champion there into second position, six seconds behind Oyenau. I think we should soon have Kasper Fosser to the first TV control. Here he is. Yep. And the Fosser well was on third position at control A21, second behind Perriman. And uh, ahead, 12 seconds ahead of Hoopman. Ah, but he goes into third place, uh, though. You can see how good Hoopman oh. was at this leg. Yeah. So Berryman, Hoopman, Fosser. At, after everybody has now been through that first uh, TV control. And let's it's see close if it, this is the exciting. advantage of not having run yesterday will get bigger as long as the race continues. Yeah, those uh, who ran yesterday, you feel that tightness in your legs, maybe. Those last few controls, the last bits of climb, maybe. Let's check Oli Uyanho, who is our current leader still at the finish, compared to Ruslan Glibov. And it looks like maybe 50 second lead for the Finn, but we'll soon see Glibov into 16 and 17. Here he is. But if you're about, you know, 50 seconds behind Oli Oyanaho at the moment, that's still a top three position by the time he gets to the finish. Although lots of runners still in the mix, though, especially the likes of Albin Rudefeld, Mika Kimmela as well. Leap off. Was, yeah, about eight seconds behind at the first TV control compared to Oli Oyanao. I lost time here. Be in the picture soon. Here he is uh, losing about 45 seconds. Second in this, yeah, second section of the race. Feels like we've got a very expectant crowd here in the arena watching what the likes of Daniel Hubman can do. Now he is the last Swiss in the terrain. Not the best route there for Emil Svensk. Ah, missing control 15 as well. Did a mistake there. Now almost, yeah, almost exactly a minute behind. That's a good, you know, good spot to say. 15 is is quite tricky because it's just yeah. on the top of the of the spur. You've got that, you've got the the dip there. It's it's quite a little bit kind of denser terrain around there as well, I'd say. So and hard to kind of more undergrowth as well. A little bit harder to see the contours. But here's Emil Svensk, and will he be beaten by his brother today? I think so. If it looks the same. Ah, oh, might be tight. Let's have a look. Towards control number 16. Victor Svensk is 42 seconds behind. Oli Oya now at uh, control 17, though. Here he is. Here he is at control 16. Yep, so we get the time check at the next control. There you go, there's the two Svensk brothers. Ah, this will be This might be a family, <laughs> family pride think uh, today. Yeah, soon they will have to put the at least one letter of the first name there, otherwise we will... It would be very hard to <laughs> see the, the difference. But the four seconds between the two brothers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, finish Eskil Shinneberry. And something has happened to Eskil Shinneberry today because this is not where he would want to be. It's going to be outside the top 20. 
confusion on the top of the hill as well, but ah, oh, it's not really what you want to see from Eskil Shinabri at all. Over three minutes slower than Oli Urano. But we are looking for maybe Riederfeld next, maybe Glibov we've seen soon. Looking at the splits then for Eskil. I think we just could... Uh, Here's Daniel Hubman. could just... Uh, See Oyano with the French TV team, and uh, they were surprised that he said that he would try in French. I guess that was what they were talking about. But you can see here, Hoopman with an advantage compared to Oyano. But he looked like on the way to control Fort Zin, he was in the slope, in the rocky section. It's going to be interesting to see what he can do but we get the time of course control number 17. Mm, the gap at control nine was 17 seconds so he has about a minute to go he's not been at control 16 yet nope. and between 16 and 17 it's about half a minute to go ah, not sure he's ah, he's not in and now he knows the camera op hasn't followed him. This is a mistake then. see ben. another runner there. Was Magna Dali. Maybe he will save Hoopman's day here. But Alvin Riederfeldt here into the finish then. Oh, and is this going to be a new leading time? I think it's time? good enough. I think this could be. Alvin Riederfeldt has had a great run here. Haven't seen much of him at all around the course, but he is going to go and set a new leading time here. The Swede working really hard here, and he's know it's going to be close, but of course, a new leading time there for Alvin Riederfeldt. Mm, and here we're back here with we have Daniel Hoopman. I think he has a few seconds left. Let's see here, punching there to new leading time. It is a new leading time then, but Rita felt no, we know he had a good end of the course and the deficit I think I think Hoopman was very lucky there to yeah. have Magnadelli behind him because it seemed that he kind of saved his day there by just going straight to the control. So a small mistake, but he maintains the lead. But he's got Gustav Bowman and Kasper Fossa behind, close behind. They are the next two who will see through into this TV control number two. And he knows they're going to be running really fast. Let's compare uh, then Bergman to Riederfeldt, who's our current leader. And looks like Gustav Bowman's yeah. had some problems here, I think. Yeah, if we compare yeah. Bergman to Riederfeldt at first TV control, then he was 20 seconds ahead. Now he's behind. I wonder where that time was lost then. And I mean, uh, Riederfeldt really. is 16 seconds behind Hoopman as well. So this is about... Yeah, let's say about half a minute compared to Hoopman, of course. Uh, maybe at this point in time it's more because Hoopman did a mistake at 16 as well. Boy, oh, Alvin Riederfeldt knows it's going to be tight, but thumbs up from Seems him. Seems to be quite satisfied with his race. As you said, we haven't seen much of his race, but maybe we get the chance now mm. following him on the GPS here. Feels like there's still a lot of controls to go, a lot of potential for, for stuff to happen, to be honest. So at this point, I'm at a loss as to who's going to win this. It's really, really open. Mm. But Bergman, who said that he still suffers a bit of back pain. It's the reason why he wasn't running yesterday. Of course, I mean, if you have problems with, with kind of an injury and then um, you are in the fight for the overall World Cup. But it's kind of understandable that you focus on the individual races. Of course, it's a pity for for us who follow the relay, but it's kind of the 
the price you pay when you have to relay as the first race. Small struggles here, small problems for Bellyman. And uh, yeah. we know it's about half a minute from there, so I think he's almost a minute behind. Mm. Yeah, you could tell he lost a little bit of time into that control. Wasn't loads, but maybe similar to Daniel Hubman as well. Mm, let's see here. It's maybe not a minute, but it's more than 50 seconds. Yeah. I wonder if he's going to know what, what the feeling of, of uh, having a bit of a scrappy race there, maybe. But Glibov into the finish now. It looks like he's going to be top five at the moment. Pretty, pretty strong race, I think, for the Ukrainian. And of course, we'll get lots of support into the finish line here, where it's a clear spot in fifth place for Ruslan Glibov. OK. This is... Let's see, Mil Svensk on the way to the last control. We saw he had a little bit of a miss at control number 15, but you can see he's very soon going to be slower than the time of Albin Riederfeldt. And even sooner, just a few seconds later, he's going to be slower than Oli Oyano as well. We wait for him here and see where, what position he could finish in. Is he going to get set a new third fastest time? Uh, it's going to be a race against his brother, I think, here for Family Pride. So Emil Svensk versus Victor Svensk. Oh, it's going to be tight. Just, it's going to be so tight here. Who will take that third spot? I think it will be the more experienced Emil Svensk who will take that third spot, but so close between the brothers. Uh, he throws his map on the ground. He is not happy with that at all. Oh, beating his brother by two seconds. I, I can tell you that's an important call, those yeah. two seconds. But let's focus on this here because we have a new leader at Control 17. It was, uh, meanwhile, we saw Sven's coming to the finish. Kasper Fosser got to Control 16 and 17. And uh, when we compare him with Daniel Hoopman, he's 18 seconds ahead. and. Uh, I mean, uh, we have Gustav Berryman on position seven there. So he would win about 60 more points here. That would decide the overall World Cup, more or less, if he would win that race. But it's still, it's still quite close. And we've seen mistakes from people heading down this um, the slope. There's still a lot of controls to go, but Kasper Fosser in the best position right now. And the, the fight now looking to be between Daniel Hubman and Kasper Fosser. We really want to see this. Oh, but Hubman is oh really close to Albin Riederfeldt here, just slightly behind. Oh, they're so close here, these two runners. This is going to be really interesting. And the Swiss crowd are all looking up at their big screen to see where their man Daniel Hubman is and how he's going to compare to Albin Riederfeldt. They're going to give him a lot of support as he comes through the into the finish here. So we're live with Daniel Hubman. Looks like he's found that control, no problem. But now dropping down this slope to uh, pass underneath the railway line. And then just a couple more controls to go. This is it's going to be a there, couple of seconds in There will be no time it. for him to hesitate just no, to do it towards is. the last control. So drops down underneath the railway line, has to turn left here. Just checking his map. This is one of the only parts of track running here, and he's not going to know. Look, we've already got the time ticking down between oh, him be really, and Riedefeld. Really tight. Might be close to Oyano as well, as we see uh, third to last starter. He's got to watch out for the cyclist. And we'll go quite directly into the forest towards this control. Good control taken there. 
Of Here course, that's not a difficult control, but now it's only a few meters left, and he has no time to hesitate now on this hill just before the last control. No, and I think he says some cheers. You hear by that control, he knows it's going to be close, and all of the Swiss crowd turn their heads to cheer him in. This is going to be interesting here. Daniel Hubman races be so down close. the hill. This is going to be incredibly tight here for Daniel Hubman. Ah, it's he's had an maybe not good enough. Oh, he's going to round this hill and the seconds tick down. He's going to punch this control. He just takes another look at his map. Oh. Ten seconds to go. Oh, I don't know what it's going to be. Oh, this, this is, is going to be really, really tight. For him and he goes straight towards the line. Let's call it. Let's see what it's going to be. I wonder if it's going to be the same. He's no. one second slower than Albin Riederfeld. Goodness me, that is one of the closest finishes I've seen. Poor Albin Riederfeld oh, knows I mean, he is uh, lucky there. How good did <laughs> Riederfeld perform this last bit? Because he didn't have the crowd cheering him all the way to the finish and still he could keep that two or three seconds he had an advantage at the second last or third last control. And I mean, Hoopman didn't, he didn't like lose any seconds here on this last part. So that was a very no, nice fight for the lead. No, I think he even gained a few lead. seconds, but wow. I wonder if there was a few mistakes towards the end. And here with his family. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just said that he missed once when the cameraman was with him. Yeah, we know. We saw that at 16. Uh, and I mean, like, oh, is there a small mistake? Oh, I know that. No. I almost, <laughs> I almost did that as well when I was pre-running. So this looks clear for Casper Fossa. As long as he can find this boulder, okay, number 22. This looks yeah, like a clear uh, win. Should have Gustav Bergman to the finish soon as well. I guess. Yes, I would be surprised if Fosso had caught him up. I mean, maybe Kasper Foss is 108 in front of Perryman at the second TV control. So he should be here very soon, Gustav. Ah, but here's Kasper Fosse. Just putting on the brakes to make it can see Gustav. Gustav Berryman in front. So Kasper Fosse will have loads of good feedback knowing he's catching up. The Swede, who we saw again make a small mistake at control number 16. But at the time, look, is fantastic for Kasper Fosse. The last starter is going to be making good headway to defend his uh, World Cup title. We'll see if we can do the maths and figure out whether that's going to have secured it for him already. But Kasper Fossa has really put his foot down on the, on the end and just not really many mistakes at all. We saw a few mistakes from Gustav Bergman today, even though he also had high speed and didn't have yesterday's run in his legs. So Kasper Fossa, let's focus on him. It's terrain that suited the Norwegians. It's terrain that suited Kasper Harlem Fosser. And it's going to be another win on the World Cup circuit for the world's long and sprint distance champion, Kasper Fosser. It will be by less and, than a uh, minute so far. He's already can punch the air. And I can, can tell take you, some it's not only support. the win of the course today, it's also the win in the overall World Cup because uh, Gustav Bergman is not inside the top four. And uh, let's see, Martin Rikborn is 42 behind. So, yeah, even he is too far behind. They should have been within the top four, but they're outside. So this is the new overall World Cup winner here. So with one race to spare, Kasper Fossa is the overall World Cup champion with an incredible or performance on his last At least years. if my calculation is right. I have to, I have to double check <laughs> We've it. We've done very quick maths and we think that is the case. But just from, the, from our looking on the GPS tracking from his look in the terrain, it looked very, very smooth for Kasper Fossa. Didn't seem to be making kind of those small mistakes, those small hesitations like we saw around Control 16. Maybe something small at 21, but 
Ah, he has time to even get the applause from the crowd here and punch the air. It's not been the easiest season for him with injury over the winter but and a, and a tricky european championships but this is exactly what you want to feel before I you head into the world championships. calculation was just right but it's a few <laughs> a few points only so uh, we have to wait to get that confirmed confirmed but i think it's by like you five don't points. trust your own maths no you? i don't do it not under pressure <laughs> <laughs> so we can say then these final results casper foster taking that win alvin riederfeld in second place daniel hubman is third place by just the one second. And I mean, Oli Oyanho, the best uh, result for him so far. Fourth place, 57 seconds. Emil Svensk, Victor Svensk is doing well too. And look at how many Swedes are in that top 10. Impressive stuff from then. Of course, a lot of their top runners sat out of the relay um, yesterday. And well, we saw those two uh, Swiss victories. It has been victory for Sweden and for Norway today as we look further down those results list. And I mean, we yeah, we kind of talked that this is a bit more Scandinavian style terrain uh, suiting suiting those runners. The, yeah, the Swiss I would say I was less, right. Less good races today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was right because we have many Scandinavian runners there in the top ten. Uh, Daniel Hoopman in third position, very very good performance. He's never he never stops to kind of perform on this level, but I mean a very good run also by Kasper Foster. Some time lost there between the, uh, control eight and nine on the long route, but otherwise I mean he was just outstanding today. He didn't do the mistakes many of the others did when we saw them towards control 16 or 17. Uh, so, uh, well, it's not a surprise that he's going to win the overall World Cup, but the way he does it, it's just so, so good. And if you think, I mean, if you just see him running, you could think that he's so experienced, but he's not. I mean, he's, he's still very, very young. Yeah, he really is. But Daniel Huffman gets another medal on the World Cup rounds. And... You know, I have to confess, you've, you've seen his kind of results dropping a little bit on the World Cup circuit. You thought, does it have it in him to win another medal here? And I mean, he just proved me wrong. But they, they told us that before the European champs, he was in great shape and he was really dominating the trainings of the Swiss team. And then, he, then he got uh, ill and uh, like just dropped that possibility. And I think he shows here that he still is in good shape. Alvin Riederfeld, of course, in second place. And Casper Fosser, one more time on top of the podium to take the World Cup title today and overall title. I double and, and I think triple he's, checked it, and I'm quite confident quite, that it's true. Yeah. No, he should be on 322 points, and uh, Rick Bonner on 217, and Berryman on 208, if my calculation is right. So, so it should that be gap of 105 points is impossible to uh, for anybody yeah. to catch up. The only up possibility then. is if, if my calculation is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That could save the, the others. Well, let's talk about the route instead of your calculations <laughs> and see what went well for these three. Yeah, you can see here this first control. So you see that there is a small hesitation for Hoopman towards the first control, but all within a few seconds only. This is very open orienteering, very nice orienteering. And then they approach this climb here. I mean, you can just count the lines there. It's more than 100 meters in one bit. To do. It's not as extreme as yesterday, but it's still a quite a tough uphill run there. And then just after that, you got the long leg to control nine. And look at Hoopman here, how he can, he, how well he executes it. He, he just jumps over to this small track. You see that? That's how much Fossil loses and not doing this. It's just this small detail that ma that makes a difference of about 15 seconds. And then in this part, Hoopman is really strong and just kind of orienteering away from the others. Then might get up a bit high in the slope there. You can see that Fossil is getting closer again in this bit. And then here he keeps on the track for a longer time. And it 
that's the part soon to control 16 when we saw Hoopman do a small mistake with just behind the cameraman when he got Magnedali saving his day kind of by getting back and uh, now you can see how Foster, he uses that yellow line. He's, only th he's the only one of them using it, and it's really fast there to run. Small mistake to control 21, but here, I mean, the, the fight, the race was decided, and then we see behind this tight race for the second place between Riedefeld and Uppmann. And they were neck and neck all the way, but they were had exactly the same speed and no yeah, Kasper, Foster, technical purpose. to your win today. How was your race? Tell us about your race. Thank you. I was, uh, I, I'm uh, I really, uh, I think I really surprised myself today. Uh, last time I ran uh, middle distance in uh, high altitude, uh, four weeks ago, I was six minutes uh, behind, so uh, managing to like learn from, uh, learn from that training camp in Switzerland and uh, understand how to run in altitude has been uh, very important and I, uh, I'm uh, extremely satisfied with the race today. Well, what's the key to success today in this terrain? Yeah, I think uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I was not so happy with my uh, technique yesterday on the relay. I did a little bit too many mistakes and I wasn't really in the right mental state. So today I really worked with myself before I start to, to try to think, okay, how, it's, how is it supposed to feel like when I run this middle and what, what, should, I, uh, what should be my focus? And then I uh, thought back to last year's uh, World Cup final middle distance. Which was also a really tricky middle, and I thought, and there I was more, there I focused more on like really being accurate with the map and letting the the orienteering uh, like be in control of the speed and not the other way. Uh, and I, I managed that really well today, and uh, I have almost only small small mistakes uh, today, and that's that's really good for me. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I liked. Uh the statement that he let the technique set the pace and not the other way around. I think that was very important today. Something we highlighted from the beginning, and it's really that detail, or I don't know if you call it a detail, it's quite the main part of this race, <laughs> but it, it decided the race because the other ones had mistakes at one point throughout the race. Yeah, it's 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 the key to orienteering at any terrain, any race, but it's so easy at this level to kind of push you too mean, hard and, and to let that, that basic principle of orienteering mean, just go out the window. I mean, it's, it should always be the rule that the technique sets the pace, but in some kind of terrain, you can survive by taking chances and the, the, like your chance is okay to, to get the control anyway, but in this kind of terrain, you can't do it. Once you overdo it and you take it to a risk too big, yeah you just lose the race. And I get the feeling Casper Fosser likes to be an underdog, actually. He <laughs> likes to kind of feel like is he, he has something underdog? to prove. No, but he, like, he isn't. He's a, he's a favourite. He's always one of the favourites whenever he starts a race now. But he likes to feel, I think, like he has something to prove. You know, he referenced yeah. being six minutes down at a previous middle distance race, and he felt like he should do better but than I that. But I also feel that his day Days being an underdog, they are counting now. It's oh, just they are well. They were well they over a couple run. of years ago, yeah. I think. Um, but uh, again, so it was fewer mistakes. Making sure the orienteering was good today. That seemed to be the key. Uh, we have victories for Norway and for Sweden, and again a short recovery time into turning around to tomorrow's long distance race. We're going to be based exactly at the same arena, so maybe some similar terrain. We'll have those usual route choice aspects that we see on the long distance and we'll be back to bring you all the coverage of that tomorrow who will take the victory in the final race of 2022's world cup the titles the overall titles are already decided but there is still the prize of winning tomorrow's race up for grabs so we'll see you there see you then
the Erika Orienteering World Cup final prize giving ceremony for the relay men from yesterday. Egeka OL Weltcup Final, Siegerehrung Staffel Herren. The prizes are given by Reto Fleury, CEO Egeka Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise werden überreicht durch Reto Fleury, CEO von der Egeka Gesundheitskasse. And the prizes are donated by our presenting partner, Egeka Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unserem presenting partner, Egeka Gesundheitskasse. In sixth place, the team of France, Frédéric Tranchon, Guillaume Elias, Basile Basé. The team of Italy, Francesco Mariani, Riccardo Scalet, Mattia De Bertolis. In fourth place, the team of Czech Republic. Jonas Obacek, Milos Nikodim, Thomas Krivda. In third place, the team of Sweden, Viktor Svensk, Emil Svensk and Anton Johansson. In second place, relay men Madrisa yesterday, the team of Norway, Magnali. Kasper Fosser, Eskil Schinneberg. The winners, first place, Switzerland, Daniel Hubmann, Florian Hovald, Joey Hadorn. best teams in relay men yesterday Switzerland and Norway Sweden Czech Republic Italy and France
EGK Orienteering World Cup Finals Prize Giving Ceremony Relay Women. EGK OL World Cup Final Siegerehrung Staffel Damen. The prizes are given by Reto Fleury, CEO EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise werden überreicht durch Reto Fleury, CEO der EGK Gesundheitskasse. And the prizes are donated by our presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unserem Presenting Partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. In sixth place, the team of Poland, Alexandra Ornik, Hanna Sudol, Hanna Wisniewska. In fifth place, the team of Finland, Mia Nitunen, Marika Teni, Ida Hapala. In fourth place, team of Czech Republic. Vendula Hochiskova, Denisa Kosova, Teresa Yanushikova. In third place, the team of Norway. Tuna Bergerudlue, Maria Olausen, Andrine Bielemesen.
Erika will be ring World Cup final prize, giving so many middle distance men. EK OL World Cup final, Siegerehrung Middle Distance Herren. The prizes are given by Reto Fleury, CEO EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise werden überreicht durch Reto Fleury, CEO der EGK Gesundheitskasse. And the prizes are donated by our presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unserem presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. In the sixth place. Representing Sweden, Viktor Svensk. In fifth place, also representing Sweden, Emil Svensk. In fourth place, Representing Finland, Oli Oyanau. Ladies and gentlemen, in third place, representing Switzerland, Daniel Hupmann. In second place, representing Sweden, Albin Riedefeld. And in fourth place, ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the middle distance here in Davos, Switzerland today, representing Norway, Kasper Fosser. So there you have them, the six best in the men's race today. Kasper Fosser, Albi Riedefeldt, Daniel Hoffman, Olli Ojanau, Emil Svensk and Viktor Svensk. EGK orienteering World Cup finals. Prize giving so many middle distance women. EGK OL World Cup final. Siegerehrung Middle Distance Damen. And the prizes are given once again by Reto Fleury, CEO EGK EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise werden überreicht durch Reto Fleury, CEO der EGK Gesundheitskasse. And the prizes are also donated by our presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unseren presenting Partnern EGK Gesundheitskasse. In sixth place, representing Switzerland, Marion Ebi. In fifth place, also representing Switzerland, Simona Eversold. In fourth place, representing Sweden, Sora Hockström. In 
four plates, also representing Sweden, Lisa Risby. In second place, representing Norway, Andrina Benemesen. Simona Eversold and Marion Abbey. So that was all for today, this uh, beautiful Sunday, sunny Sunday, really. And tomorrow, Monday, we will have the last event of the World Cup season 2022, a long distance. Also, this, that event here at Arena Hövalt in Davos. Herzlichen Dank für euer Erscheinen heute, fürs kräftige Applaudieren der Läuferinnen für die packenden Wettkämpfe im Wald. Wir sehen uns morgen wieder zum Abschluss der Weltcup-Saison 2022 mit einem langen Distanzwettkampf mit der gleichen Zielarena. Herzlichen Dank und gute Rückreise.